That is a demonic spirit. I better take that. Okie dokie. Okie dokie, doggy boys. You doggy boys. Y'all doggy boys. Y'all are some good boys. If I had some more dog bones, I'd give them to you. If I had some more dog bones, I'd give them to you. I would, buddy. Good afternoon. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I gotta grab my other Bible. Set that's not too tangled. I wasn't really prepared. Hello, how is everyone doing today? Let's see, I gotta plug my headset in. I really like to use my headset. I'm on here. I like to use reverb so I can hear myself talk. Also, I feel like people hear me a lot better when I use these headsets. I have a microphone um, with a boom and everything like that, but I actually was having trouble getting it to even work. Um, I had a big mic, like a big professional looking one that plugs into the phone, but I was plugging into my phone and I don't think it was making a difference. I couldn't tell. I, I really, I'm not real techno, uh, I'm not a big technology guy by any means, so my wife is much more uh, technology in, uh, inclined than I am. Hello, hello. Oh, man, so I don't ever plan what I'm going to talk about when I come on here. It's always random. It's always entirely <laughs> random. But I, I do know uh, one thing that's always on my heart is to talk about repentance. 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 Like true repentance. Um, there's so many doctrines going around on, on TikTok and social media, and there's all these different churches and you know, a big part of my testimony is I was a lukewarm Christian for a long time in my life. And I had many, many demons. Like I, I, for real, I really had demons. Like there was, um, like sin has consequences is what I'm saying. Like the, the different, like, so someone asked me recently, like is repentance to, does that mean that you feel sorry when you sin? Well, well to answer that question, you, yes, you're going to feel conviction from the Holy Spirit when you sin, but it doesn't just mean you're sorry. Re repent, repentance means metanoia in the Greek. It means to turn away. So, for instance, when Jesus healed people all throughout the Bible, he would tell them to go and sin no more, lest something worse shall happen, shall come upon you. So, literally, like, there's a direct correlation between sin and and consequences in the Holy Spirit. He, he like, so I've been in the process of isolation. Like, uh, if, if there's some people here for sure that will relate to this, like when God calls you into the prophetic, he will oftentimes pull you aside. You might, you might not have a job for a while. You may be like me. Like I, I went through a bankruptcy. I was in a sick bed. I used to have uh, a lot of sin in my life up until like 2020. God began consecrating me. It's like you're a, um, it's like being a wine grape, like you're a grape and then God's just squeezing you to get that wine out of you. And it can be, it's the crushing is what I'm talking about. Amen. So you get alone with the Lord and you'll pray in the spirit. You get into your, your Bibles and your Bible, and then you get a journal and then you'll start hearing from the Lord. This is what happened to me, you guys. Like, so for me, like I have prophetic words like all over the place you know like from the lord he's i speak to the lord and i get quiet and the lord speaks to me and i don't boast in any way or shape or form this is all glory to god but uh, for people that have been a black sheep your whole life and you've just been kicked out of church the religious denominations don't like you yes amen thankfully the, the crushing doesn't happen all at once it would be too much it would be it would be too much let me let my hound dog out I'll say, you guys can say hi to Arlo. This is the, so that's the good boy. That's Bruno. And there's Arlo, the baby. He's a puppy. This is a little puppy. How old are you, Arlo? Three months old now? 
Are you three months old? He was the size of a grapefruit when we got him. He could fit in my hand and perch on my shoulder. We got him at six weeks old. He was His eyes were barely open. And uh, and then Bruno back there, he's like 10, the little the, the tan guy. So this dog is a hound. This is a hound dog mixed with a black lab. And he loves baby talk. He loves baby talk. And he gets, but he does get very... This guy right here gets so jealous of his big brother, Bruno, over there. So this, this little guy keeps me up and my wife up at night. This is Bruno. And what he does is he likes, to, um, he likes to get out of bed. So this guy sleeps in our bed with us. And this one sleeps in the kennel next to our bed because he's still a puppy. He'll get up in the middle of the night and try to go potty in the house and stuff. But Bruno, he's, this guy's 10. And then this one's three, th- about three months, and he's growing like a weed. This guy's gonna get bigger. He like look at his paws, you guys. Like look how big his paws are. He's got big paws. He's still growing. I don't know how big he's gonna be. My wife thinks like maybe fifty-five or sixty pounds, and we're hard. It's hard to say because he's already like thirty pounds or something right now, and he's just growing like a weed at three months old. Come on, you boys. You guys need to go out. Y'all gonna go out? So they always cry at the do- they cry at the door like this, and then it, they see how hot it is outside, and they kind of debate like, do we even want to go? Because we're in Florida, so it's like a hundred degrees here, or hundred and probably a hundred. I don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, the black one is super cute. He's he's a puppy, but he's like a shark. He'll bite you in the face if you're not careful. He's he's not real well trained yet. So, but um, <clears throat> but man, so I was on TikTok today, and I don't. I don't scroll a whole, whole, a whole, whole lot. I can't believe how much better the video quality is on this iPhone than my old phone. I have an old phone that's like broken up, and it's, it's, it's like when I would come on live, like when I watched myself, it was like a cloud. It was just like a cloud. I could barely see myself on the screen. There is a way to train them. Um, there's puppy treats. You can get puppy treats. And there's videos on YouTube you can watch for how to get your dog to start to stop biting. To stop biting. Um, where was I going with this? <clears throat> yeah. So God has a purpose for everybody's life. We all have a book of life written about us. It talks about that in Psalm 139, verse 16. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. And so God has a... Um, God has a plan for all of our lives, and he, there's, a, there's a book of life. There's a book of destiny written about every single one of us. Even Hitler. Even Hitler had a book of life. Even, and people are like, what, what? How is that possible? Well, it's because people have free will. This is like where a lot of these Calvinistic teachings from, from the certain churches are just not right, where they, 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 they teach that nobody has free will. And... Um, so the truth of the matter is, is that God does honor people's free will. So, you know, it, it, and, and this is what the Bible teaches is that like, you know, what Galatians chapter five nineteen talks about is if people walk in the flesh and make it a habitual habit, those people do not inherit the kingdom of God. So sin is a very big problem. And, and what happens is, is when people, um, when people, let me take care of this. So when, when people um, make it a habit, like, so a lot of people teach that just believe that Jesus is God and you're and like, that's it. Once saved, always saved. But that's not the Bible. That's just what man has interpreted. And, and they've, they've created a doctrine they call once saved, always saved. They made, they make a doctrine, a doctrine out of religion. It's, all it is is religion. It's powerless. They don't believe in deliverance. They don't, they don't see people get healed, set free. They don't cast demons out. They don't believe in that. And, the, and believe it or not, a lot of churches believe that and they teach that, and it's false. It's called reform theology. It's, um, it's also called cessationism. That's another name for it. Um, reform theology, cessationism. It's it's commonly taught. I mean, it's taught in a lot of churches, and and it's um it's not it's just not truth, you know. So, you know, once you've lived through a deliverance and had deliverance done, once you've had deliverance done on you, and you've had demons cast out of you, you start realizing like, wait a minute, this stuff's very real. And and then the bigger question is is why are the demons there? 
Why are the demons there? So yeah, that's right. It's God the Father, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And then we, and then we have the Holy Spirit down here on earth. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He gives us all wisdom. Um, he, he brings all things that Jesus taught us to remembrance. He's in uh, John chapter 14, verse um, 26. Okay, i got to close this window on my computer. I was gonna, I'm was going to read a prophetic word here that the Lord gave me last night. Um, I post this. I post prophetic words on Facebook as well. Um, and this is what the Lord said to me last night. You have got to let go of your fear of letting go. You are on the correct path to freedom. There is nothing behind you to look at. There's no way of escaping my judgment in regards to people who are not willing to let go of the wrong people from their life. So what you need to do is continue to abide in me and rest with me. You have absolutely nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing to be fearful over. I have spared you from the harm of your past, and I have placed you on my righteous path to freedom. You are safe with me, and I have nothing to say that you should be fearful over. Trust in me that everything will be safe in my hand in the coming days of judgment. What takes place around you will be the work of my hand. Again, you have absolutely nothing to fear. Swept up like an eagle, you will be with me, for I have declared judgment over your enemies, says the Lord. We have nothing to reconcile in regards to any of your fears. What is coming to pass will soon look like great flames of fire all around you. In my hand, you will be hidden from all harm. There's nothing for you to be afraid over. This judgment isn't against my people that walk with me and abide in me. This is a decree of judgment over those who that have worked against you in this past season of your life regarding betrayal. I have hidden you in the palm of my hand. Your security comes from me. Don't let yourself think there won't be changes coming because there will be. Your heart is tender and dear to me. I am shielding you from so much pain that the enemy wishes to inflict upon you. If you only knew what I am protecting you from, you would continue to be very grateful. I have no corrective words against you. Your case has been closed. The case has been dismissed, and I am now bringing you into the secret place where you will discover my wise counsel to be often and necessary regarding your very bright future. Stop. 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 You are not weak or powerless. You have nothing like you are nothing like the person that those around you have believed you to be. I have destined you for greatness and I shall see it come to pass with my eagle eye vision. I am leading you along a hidden path far away from all harm and anyone that desires to do evil against you. Your enemies have tried to lay a trap. Stop it. Stop it. I will lock you outside. Stop. Go back. Go. Go back, Arlo. Here, go back. <clears throat> Your enemies have tried to lay a trap. I, however, have planned their destruction as they will soon be trapped by their own snares, says I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Your victory rests securely in the palm of my hand. Rest assured, rest secured, knowing that absolutely nothing bad will happen to you. You are not a false prophet or anything that your enemies have claimed you to be. I have spoken greatness over your life, and your destiny is secure in my hand, says the Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so I'm going to read some. Um, I'm going to read some more scripture that was given to me regarding this prophecy. Okay, so the story. This is out of Psalm uh, seventy, Psalm chapter seventy-eight, out of the Passion Translation. The story of Israel is a lesson in God's ways. He establishes he established decrees for Jacob and established the law in Israel, and he commanded our forefathers to teach them to their children. Hold on. Arlo, I will put you in your kennel. Go lay down. Go lay down. Go lay down. Arlo, go lay down. Let me get them a bone real quick so they'll stop barking. I'm gonna shut this door. Ahem. All right, here you go. Here, take that bone. Take that bone. <clears throat> Let's see. 
it's amazing how when you start delivering prophet prophetic words in doing deliverance, like all of the children of the devil show up into the lives. Like if you come into my chats, you'll see like there's so many devil worshipers and stuff. They always try to come in and I found that the satanic demonic people, the people that are led by the devil, children of the devil, people that worship the devil, people with lots of demons, they can't stand prophecy. And even religious devils, people that will quote scripture, but they don't believe God still speaks. That's religion. There's no power there. There's no resurrection power because they, they don't believe what they even say they believe. It's they have a form of godliness and they deny the power of God. That's literally what Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says when it says there are people who have a form of religion. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. From such people turn away. That's what Paul said in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Um, I, I mean, I do deliverance, but but what I'll tell you about deliverance is is deliverance is repentance. If someone is living in sin, so so to, for example, if someone is living in sin, you're going to have demons. The Proverbs twenty two verse five says that perverse lives are surrounded by the demonic, and and if you're um, if you're living in sin. If you're living in sin, you're gonna have you're gonna have demonic issues. Like people that hear voices and have demons and look at pornography, you gotta repent from all of that. So once you repent, and the other thing that's real big about deliverance is if you have any unforgiveness in your heart, if you're very bitter it's because there's unforgiveness in your heart. And people who have unforgiveness on their heart, according to Matthew chapter 6, you have to forgive everybody that's ever hurt you in order for your Father in heaven to forgive you. So once you accept Jesus, then everybody needs to go through deliverance, which is a matter of forgiving everybody that has hurt you. And you can't, in other words, you can't go to heaven unless you forgive everybody that hurt you, okay? So to be forgiven, you have to forgive. Secondly, once you've forgiven everybody, you need to ask you need to ask the Lord in prayer to show you if there's anyone you need to forgive. So, for example, if you're getting dreams um, every single night about the very same person over and over and over, and it's someone that hurt you in the past, you know, pray for that person. Pray that you can forgive them and release them from any and all unforgiveness. And that, you know, you don't wish harm upon your enemies, people that have harmed you greatly. So what you have to do is you have to forgive them to, to, to be forgiven. It's just plain and simple. People who walk in unforgiveness have demons because those demons attach to trauma. They attach to pain. They attach to those soul wounds in your emotional realm. So if you don't forgive everybody that um, has hurt you, then you can't be forgiven, which means you can't go to heaven if you have unforgiveness in your heart. So people that can't forgive, that's what the Bible says. It says that in Matthew chapter 6. So you have to forgive everyone that hurt you to be headed to heaven. And then um, then the other thing is, is that, um, you know, so people ask me a lot about deliverance, but, but what, it, what it is is... is, is to be delivered is to be to ha- be delivered into the, into Jesus. Jesus Christ is the deliverer. Deliver yes, deliverance is having demons cast out of you. But the but the, you have to get to the root of why do you need deliverance? So if if you just cast the demons out of somebody, and they stay in sin, the demons come back seven times worse. That's what it says in Matthew chapter twelve. So it, so you know there's more to deliverance than just casting the demon out because if if the person doesn't forgive everybody that's hurt them, and if 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 you refuse to be healed of your trauma by walking in unforgiveness, then you will then you will um, then you will uh, have demons. You will have demons. <clears throat> So Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 21 is a good set of scripture to, to walk into because it teaches you how to walk in the spirit, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. It says in Galatians five nineteen, people who walk in sin, like people who habitually sin, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it says, that what Jesus said the way is narrow. So Galatians 5.19 gives a list of people who are fornicators, looking at pornography, sexual morality, living in drunkenness. Um, if you choose to remain in sin, you know, in 1 John chapter 3, it, start, it says, you know, I'll, I'll open it, I'll read it. Let's talk about sin. Let's talk about sin. Because a lot of people have believed what they, they, they call it, the gospel of grace. They think that because, they think that because uh, there's grace 
that you can just live in sin and that it's okay because these are the same people they'll say, oh, we're all sinners. Oh, we're just nothing but wicked sinners. No, you were once a sinner and then you come to Jesus Christ. He forgives you and you repent, which means go and sin no more, lest something worse shall happen to you. Jesus said those words. So let's start at Galatians 5.16 because I think a lot of people don't understand a lot of people don't understand that you can grieve the Holy Spirit according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. And then you go to Galatians 5, verse 16, and it says this. Let me emphasize this. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. When your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit, you hinder him from leaving, living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your self-life from dominating you. So then, the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the Spirit. But when you yield to the life of the Spirit, you will no longer be living under the law, but soaring above it. The behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, and manipulating others... Hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? That's talking about salvation. So people, people that, you know, there's people out there that, that don't believe that the whole Bible is for them. They, they believe it's a very small part of the, of the Bible, and that's just not true. That's what so many churches teach, though. Um, I used to sit in a Baptist church that taught like that, that taught once saved, always saved. And they, they, they taught that God doesn't communicate with us in dreams, which is completely wrong. I mean, read Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Glory to God, I was, yeah, I mean, I, so, so, so what happens is, is it's like this, there, there's such a thing as, as carnal Christianity, and, and carnal, it, carnal Christianity is what a lot of these mega churches preach, that you can just believe Jesus, and Jesus, and, and that's it, you're good to go, and, 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 and if you preach that it's okay to sin, and live in sin, and constantly just live in willful sin, and you're still on your way to heaven, you'll easily pack full of mega church full of people that will give you money because they're, get, they're, they're heaping themselves up, teachers, that, because they have itching ears. It's because they have itching ears. So if someone remains in sin, let's just talk about this. Let's read First John chapter 3. This is why you have to repent, because if someone doesn't repent, where, where are they headed, you know? And, and there's too much lukewarm teaching out there because people are afraid to be offended. You know, like, if you're offended by the truth, that's called conviction. You know, conviction's a good thing. Arlo. Arlo, hush. <clears throat> you know, I care about your souls, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not preaching what makes people feel good. I'm not going to preach what people um, feel good. It, I, I don't want to pr- tell people just what they want to hear. A lot of, you know, that's what happens in a lot of big mega churches, and they and they say things that make you feel good. They're going to tell you, oh, it's okay to live in sin. It's not okay to live in sin. Um, let's talk about that. I'm in First John chapter three. I'm going to start at verse four. The character of God's children. Anyone who indulges in sin lives in moral anarchy. For the definition of sin is breaking God's law. And you know without a doubt that Jesus was revealed to eradicate sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who can, now catch this, anyone who continues to live in union with him will not sin. But the one who continues sinning hasn't seen him with discernment or known him by intimate experience. Delightfully loved children, don't let anyone divert you from this truth. The person who keeps doing what is right proves that he is righteous before God, even as the Messiah is righteous. But the one who indulges in a sinful life is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil. 
Everyone who is truly God's child will refuse to keep sinning because God's seed remains within him, and he is unable to continue sinning because he has been fathered by God himself. So here is how God's children can be clearly distinguished from the children of the evil one. Anyone who does not demonstrate righteousness and show love to fellow believers is not living with God as his source. So if someone believes that it's okay to sin and live in willful sin, that's, you know, that's just not the case, unfortunately. <clears throat> you know, so people, there, the, 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 there's religious Pheresies on this earth today, and, and, these, and there's, there, it's just dead works. It's just religion that, that teaches that people can live in sin because religion teaches you that you're always going to be a sinner, which denies sanctification. Sanctification is a daily walk with the Lord. It's the transformation of your inner man. It means that you're born again, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be convicted that it's wrong to sin. You'll, you're going to lose your desire. You'll become dead to sin. <clears throat> praying in the spirit, praying in tongues is a great way to hear from the Lord. A lot of people may have never even received a prophetic word from the Lord, and it's important, you know. Think of it this way. In Matthew chapter 7, there's people that will come to Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, that say, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied and cast out demons in your name? And Jesus says to these people who believe in him, by the way, they believe in Jesus. They cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And then he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Why does he say that? Why does Jesus tell people who believe in him to depart from me? I never knew you. Well, what does Jesus say in Luke chapter 6, verse 46? What good is it to call me Lord and Master if you don't put in practice what I preach, what I've taught you? That's what Jesus says. So, literally, it, your works do matter. What we do, it matters. We, the way that we display... The way that we display our faith is is through our actions. It's through our works, how we live, how we behave, how we treat others. And um, Arlo, come here. Stop it, puppy. These puppies are everything. Yeah, obedience matters. So the other the other thing is is these you know so so. Praying, praying the prayer of the salvation, praying a sinner's prayer. God answers the sinner's prayer. You know He does. He does. So the way you, you, the way you first get saved is you come to Jesus in prayer and you and you tell the Lord to come into your heart. You ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. But but salvation doesn't mean once saved, always saved. It, it means you're in the process of inheriting salvation. That like so to the day until the day we die, you know, death is appointed to once and to every man, and then we all have a day of judgment where we will give an account of what we do in this body. Everything counts. Everything counts. So everything that we do in this body counts. That's what I want to I want everybody to know that that. You have to choose. You have to choose to be intentional in this life because God honors our free will, you know. And um, and 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 I I am a I I cast out demons and I prophesy, but I have to stay a life. I have to live a life of repentance and humility. Um, it says in James chapter four that God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. So. A lot of times what happens is um, people get traumatized or wounded somewhere early on in life. But, uh, bad things have happened and then they become very bitter because if, if they're walking in unforgiveness, people become bitter. They, they don't have joy in their life. And if they, if you, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. So we have to check our own fruit. I asked God to judge me early. Do I know Isaiah Saldivar? I saw Isaiah Saldivar um, last Two weeks ago in Orlando, he had a. Um, I don't know Isaiah Saldivar. I'm friends with. I know Gabriel Storm, who's friends with him. They travel with Dan from SNL. Um, and I, again, I've never met Dan, and I, I've never met Isaiah. I was two feet away from him. I, I just haven't spoke to them. I, I don't personally know them. But if you guys look on TikTok, like uh, I know Gabriel Storm. He has like a million followers. He's a pretty big. I don't know if he has a million. He might have a half million. I think Isaiah has like uh, half a million followers or something, three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. He's pretty big, but yeah, we're all in the process of being saved, and and we have free will. So you know, 
And, and again, like a lot of churches don't talk about like Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Like it talks about people who don't repent. It's a warning for people that do not repent. It's a final warning is what it is. Yes, bitterness is caused by unforgiveness. Can you recommend a church in Florida? Um, so, you know, I personally don't have a home church. I, I'm a student of Warrior Notes School of Ministry, which is on online. It's on the internet. And, you know, I've had... I've had some some interesting experiences with churches here. I've been uninvited from certain churches. I've been asked not to return from certain churches. I went to a church here where I live in Florida, and the pastor had a demon, and I gave my testimony, and the demon came out of the pastor, and she had someone from her staff get in contact with someone that knew me, and she asked me not to return. So that was one church I was kicked out of, and um, I was and all I was there doing is I was there serving that day, serving the homeless food. Um, and then I had another person that was a pastor that um, told me he didn't agree with my prophetic words, he didn't like them. He did. He just didn't like it. He didn't believe in. Uh, he did. He didn't believe in the prophetic gifting that God spoke through me. And so I found that some pastors operate out of control and manipulation. They want. Um, they want a lot of control, and they want everyone to like them. And honestly, that's a pride issue. That's something that you know. Anyone that's going into ministry or if you're even just, you know, like I don't have a title. I'm not a pastor. I don't have any titles. I'm just, I'm just me. I'm I'm a, I'm a Christian. And, um, I, I, you know, I study the word of God. I'm born again, but I don't belong, I like, I don't belong to a particular denomination of, of religion or anything. Um, but you know, so from what I've seen though, like a lot of times people, if someone was wounded, this is going to be real important. This will, this will be a good uh, revelation for someone I know, um, when people are wounded, like I'll give you an example. Like if you were rejected by your father, your mother, you've been abused by like narcissistic abuse a lot in your life. Well, if you go into ministry and suddenly you get a lot of attention, it can be a temptation to appeal to people and just be very friendly and tell them what they want to hear. Because again, though, that can be manipulation and that this is what it says. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I would rather someone be honest with me and just boom, hit me up. Like, tell me the truth. Who is my mentor? Kevin Zadai, Dr. Kevin Zadai. I study under Warrior Notes School of Ministry. So, you know, but I also hear from the Holy Spirit. I have a relationship with Jesus. I hear from the Lord. So I don't, it, again, like, you know, I, I'm a student of a, of a, of a, you know, of a ministry outreach, but at the same time, like I hear from the Lord, I, I speak to God, God speaks to me. So, you know, a lot of, a lot, like when people say you have to belong to a, a religious denomination or have a, you know, have a head covering something like that, that's, that's not true. I cast, I've cast demons out of people at a gas station parking lot and I don't belong to like a denominational church and have like a head covering Yes, I'm a Christian. I mean, I'm a Christian, but the thing the thing nowadays though is so many people call themselves Christians, but they think it's just because like even the demons believe in Jesus. It says in James chapter 2 that even the devils believe in Jesus. They tremble and they fear him in his presence. So, but there's but yeah, so there's a lot of stuff like a lot of pastors don't like deliverance. A lot of pastors don't like deliverance. A lot of pastors don't like p- people casting out demons because it goes against their religious theology. If if they don't believe that a, a pastor, if a pastor is teaching Christians can't have demons just because you believe in God, like come on, if someone's living a lukewarm life full of sin, they're got they got demons. And so what ends up happening is people just talk about love and talk about grace, but they don't talk about repentance. They don't speak the truth. They don't talk about the power of the blood of Jesus. They don't talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they don't talk about holiness, righteousness, and repentance. And the religious Pharisee spirit that opposed Jesus in Jesus' day is still on this earth in some churches. Spirit of Jezebel, for example, loves to be in church. You can get Spirit of Jezebel and it can be in the pastor of the church if they're not living a righteous and holy lifestyle privately behind closed doors. So... You know, that's that's just something I've found that in regards to walking in the prophetic, hearing from the Lord, receiving and giving prophetic words, and then casting out demons and doing deliverance is there's a lot of pastors that are lukewarm. They're lukewarm. You know, they, they 
And there's the other there's the other thing that you know if if a, the pastor can be lukewarm, they, which they can then teach it's okay to be lukewarm. If the pastor's compromised, then their message is going to be compromised because they're not going to preach against sin. Can I elaborate on spirit of Jezebel? Sure, uh, spirit of Jezebel um, happens through sexual immorality. When people when people live in sin and they look at pornography, when they have sex before marriage, when they have when they cheat on their spouse, um, when they have sexually or immoral relationships, um, else, you know, non marital sexual relationships, or looking at porn or masturbation stuff like that. According to Revelation chapter two, if you study it, go into verse uh, twenty through twenty-three, where Jesus, the, the red letters in your Bible, Jesus is saying, people who tolerate the spirit of Jezebel, they're going to get thrown into a sick bed for one. So people with chronic health issues that, that that the doctors can't figure out, they usually need deliverance if they've if they've had a sexual immoral lifestyle and if that's their background. And again, that that was my background. I ended up in a sick bed for like two years. I was off and on bedridden until I had an encounter with Jesus and he set me free. Glory to God. So, but but again, if, if all you ever do is go to a lukewarm church where they don't talk about demons, they don't talk about spiritual warfare, deliverance, the power of the resurrection, power of the spirit of God, then you're not going to necessarily even know that it's not okay to sin. And they're going to teach you that sin, they're just going to tell you, your future sins are forgiven, so it's okay. Just well, you know, do your best. Just live in sin. That's not the gospel. Jesus would heal people and say, "Go and sin no more, lest something worse should happen should come upon you." So that there tells you, if you live in sin, something worse is going to happen. And then the other thing is, is when people ask about deliverance, you know, I have, I have a different a little bit different of a, of approach on deliverance. So yes, I do enjoy seeing people set free and I, I, it's, I love to cast out demons, but the, here's the thing. If I, if I just cast the demons out of you and then don't tell you to repent and teach you what true repentance is and what it looks like, if you fall back into sin after receiving deliverance, you could still end up in a, you could end up in a bad, bad place, a worse place than before. So it's so intr- it's so important. You have to learn how to put the flesh to death, which is a part of sanctification. That's a daily walk with the Lord, where you ask the Lord every day to take away selfish desires, take away the desire to have vain glory, take away my desire to have sin in my life. And um, you know the thing is though is there are people that need repeat deliverance. And what and the reason why that they need deliverance over and over and over again is because they're still living in sin. So true repentance is to turn away and go and sin no more. You just won't sin. That means you're going to cut off ungodly relationships. If you're hanging out with people that go to bars, so stop hanging out with them. Stop going to bars. Stop drinking. Stop smoking marijuana. God bless you, Victor. Love you too. You have to stop sinning. If you have a hard time around a certain group of people behaving, so here's what you do: you establish boundaries. It's just like dealing with a narcissist. Like if you, and, and again, it's 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 a similar school of thought. But what the doctors call narcissism is really describing the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is a narcissist. Satan's a narcissist. What I have encountered when I um, when I I don't rely on on human wisdom. So, by the way, I'm just I'm I'm bringing into narcissism because if you if you study the DSM five and, and 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 the cluster B personality disorders, and if you if you go to college and study psychology, I studied psychology a, little, a bit in college, and I've studied psychology a little bit here and there, and it's very interesting. If you study narcissism and cluster B personality disorders, what you'll find is everything I've learned about in the spirit realm regarding the spirit of Jezebel. It's it's the same thing as someone with BPD, borderline personality disorder. People that have a personality disorder have demons. When you cast the demons out and they repent from their sin, they don't have ups and downs. And that and that's the same reason why medication doesn't ever heal anyone and set them free. <clears throat> sin does not feel great because it sends people to hell. How do you know if you've? Um, how do you know if you? truly forgiven someone even if you've already proclaimed it out loud um because you can you can hear okay so how to know if you've forgiven someone all right so let me give you an example if someone hurt you if you've been deeply offended and um and stuff like that then if someone's hurt you really bad 
if someone's hurt you really bad, you, you you can pray for that person, and you can see that person. But you're not gonna you don't have to go around people that have hurt you. By the way, I'm talking about it's good to have boundaries. Like you can pray and forgive them, but you don't have to see them or allow them in your life anymore. But when you get to the point where it doesn't hurt to think about the memory, where you're no longer bitter towards that person, and you just pray for them that that. No, sanctification is not a one-time thing. Sanctification is a lifelong walk with God. And in some people, it can be a quicker process. That's why I asked Jesus Christ to judge me now and take away anything out of my life that doesn't need to be there. So when I stand before God one day, there's not going to be a giant burn day. It'll, it'll be like, okay, welcome in, my good and faithful servant. I don't want things or people in my life that God doesn't want me to have. So, you know, you can ask Jesus to take the memories away and he'll heal your memories too. And sometimes the memories is, is, is a hard time to let go of and time will heal that. But ultimately, God is the healer. It's not time. You know, God, God did create time, but time is, time is a construct of man. Time isn't really what people think that it is. You know, we're here for a short while. This life is but a vapor. So, again, you know, this is why it's important to, to manage our time wisely. You know, I used to spend time on video games and I would try to numb out my mind. And I realized that was idolatry, that was idolatry, and that was not a good thing to have idolatry in my life. So I had to get rid of my video games, I had to get rid of all that stuff. So, but yeah, so sanctification is not a one-time thing. Um, It's not a one-time thing, it's not a singular occurrence where you just verbally make a confession once. So sanctification is a daily walk with the Lord where every time you wake up, you turn yourself into the Lord. In other words, you repent, you humble yourself, you pray to the Lord, you thank him for forgiving you. There's a wonderful prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It starts at verse 9. It's the Lord's Prayer. I That's the prayer that I recommend praying every day. Um, but also praying in tongues. You know, you got to be born again and filled with the, the Holy Spirit to inherit the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, that, that to be born again means to inherit the kingdom of God. You have to be born of spirit and water. So that means you can pray in tongues, just like in uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You'll, you'll be able to pray in the spirit. That's your heavenly prayer language. And when you pray in tongues, it, it communicates directly between the Holy Spirit and, and with God. So it's a perfect prayer, and it is a prayer that demons can't understand. And uh, what happens when you pray in tongues a lot and when you know the word of God, your mind becomes renewed, transformed. That's how you put on the new inner man. You know, the faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But then you also have to be a doer of the word. You can't just be a hearer of the word only. That's what a Pharisee, the Pharisee spirit, you know, there's there's modern day Pharisees that will teach you. It's okay just to hear the word. You don't need to do the works, works, works. There's no works. Don't do works. Don't do works. And it's like, yeah, we do do the works. If we don't do the works, then our faith is in vain. (laughs) I mean, so these churches that say you can just sit here every Sunday and and just believe, but you don't have to do anything. Well, James says in chapter 2, faith without works is, is dead, dead faith. Catholics pray to saints. Is this wrong? Great question. To answer that, let's go to yes. The answer, the short answer is yes. It's wrong. We're gonna go to Colossians chapter two. Um, Colossians chapter two, verse eighteen. Let's get this pulled up. You know, I wish I could pull up the Passion on the internet. I haven't. I don't know which app to go under on the internet. Here's Colossians. Sometimes it's faster for me to scroll through on my computer, but. So Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 18. This is, what, this is what Paul had to say. Don't let anyone disqualify you from your prize. Don't let their pretended sincerity fool you as they deliberately lead you into their initiation of angel worship. For they take pleasure in pretending to be experts of something they know nothing about. Their reason, their reasoning is meaningless and comes only from their own opinions. They refuse to take hold of the true source, but we receive directly from him. And his life supplies vitality into every part of his body through the joining ligaments, connecting us all as one. He is the divine head who's, who guides his body and causes it to grow by the supernatural power of God. For you were included in the death of Christ and have died with him to the religious system and powers of this world. Don't retreat back to being bullied by the standards and opinions of religion. 
for example, and he goes on to talk about you know dietary restrictions and things like that that are practiced that was in, in Judaism, and then but he's also talking about angel worship, what religion worships angels and prays to the saints, which is is and you know it's necromancy in a way which is again forbidden but so yes you know what what i've seen is is that is catholicism takes the scripture where it says jesus founded the uh founded his founded it upon the rock and then and then he he talks to peter and they take an entire scripture and they twist it into meaning an entire different thing than what it is and then also what's interesting to me is is that um i have i know i do know someone that is in a the Catholic Church, and um, they'll have like a, a a long mass or something like that, where they just read the whole time, and, and I believe it's in the Greek, and no one understands it because no one in the church speaks that. So, what do you get out of attending a four hour long church service where they don't even read to you in the language you understand? It's just religion. It's just ri- it's a ritual. All it is is a ritual. You show up, you listen, you don't you don't even understand, and then you leave. And, and again, you know, call man, call no man on this earth your father. It says that in the Bible. So I'm not coming down hard against anyone, but I am telling, I, I do label things. It's very helpful to label stuff. So if you can label religion for what it is, and you know, so, you know, when, when people are hungry for the truth, I believe that is that God's way is, is he puts a, he puts a hunger in our hearts for righteousness and things like that. So, you know. Again, you know, and, and the and the Catholic Church also used to you used to atone for your sins through like through monetary payment. Like certain sins cost certain monies. It's absolutely like, and I don't think I don't know that they do that anymore. But from what I understand, they did that like up until not that long ago. It's pretty interesting when you start studying the stuff. Also, Paul says in uh, I'll go to Galatians real fast. Uh, while talking about religion and stuff like that and like denominational type religions where they vary from the truth, this is what Paul said. He said there's only one gospel. I'm in Galatians chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to go to verse 8. This is what Paul said. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a different gospel, a gospel differing than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Let me make it clear, anyone, no matter who they are, that brings you a different gospel than the gospel that you have received, let them be condemned and cursed. Bruno, uh, Arlo, stop. Stop, my puppy's biting my, a box under my foot. So he's saying, anyone, even if they're an angel or a man, it doesn't matter who, if they bring you a different gospel than what Paul, than what you have received, let them be condemned and cursed. Condemned and cursed. Whew condemned and cursed that's what he says in verse 10 he says i'm obviously not trying to flatter you or water down my message to be popular with men but my supreme passion is to please god for it all for if all i attempt to do is please people i would fail to be a true servant of christ what is a good bible to read uh so i can understand if if you're looking for a, so this is my passion bible passion is a uh, new testament only this is the passion right here. That's what mine looks like. You can order that on Amazon. The passion is New Testament. Now they eventually will come out with an Old Testament passion. It's just not out yet. They're translating it, I believe. Now in the Old Testament, I read the New Living Translation, which is NLT. Um, a lot of people have a hard time understanding Old English, which is what the KJV is. Um, but that like... And then there's the NIV, but there's been a lot of scripture kind of taken out of the NIV. Like they 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 shortened a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of people have a hard time understanding Old English. I don't I don't particularly understand Old English that well. Plus when the when the when the Lord speaks to me and I get a prophetic word, a lot of the verbiage that the Lord uses when when He speaks to me into my into my spirit and my heart, it's very much what I encounter in the Passion translation. So. I've never read that one. And there's also like the Schofield, there's like Schofield, Schofield study Bibles. There's Amplified. Amplified's a study Bible. Um, it's And by the way, if you have an app, if you download the version Bible app on your phone, iPhone or, or Android phone. Sorry, my dog's biting at my feet. I'm getting distracted here. Get out of here. 
Um, if you download the YouVersion Bible app, you will have you will be able to read Passion. TP, if the Passion translation is TPT. I love the Passion translation. It's very easy to understand. Like it's the easiest for me to understand. Um, and then when I go into the Old Testament, it's NLT. But but again, so here this is something that's real heavy on my heart. Is that um, replying back to him real fast? I have a friend of mine that is uh, he does a deliverance as well. I just was talking to him. God bless you, Nelson, if you're on here. <laughs> Jesus loves you. <clears throat> so, but yeah, so I don't, I don't come on here. I don't come on here um, to argue with people. That's like fruit of the flesh. It's walking in the flesh. And the Bible says in Galatians 5.19, people that fulfill the, 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 the works of the flesh, like they're not headed to heaven, you know, they're, if, if they make it a habit, if, if someone makes it a habit to live in willful, intentional sin, um, the, the Bible teaches that, that those people, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So if you occasionally accidentally sin or you slip up, that's, you know, God's grace covers a mistake. This is what the Lord told me one day, that the grace of God, the Lord spoke to me one day, he said to me, Holy Spirit said to me one day, my grace covers your mistakes, which is a lot different than having an excuse, right? So if you commit a, a, if you make a mistake and then you start turning it into excuses, that's a lot different. That's a lot different. So if you make a mistake, you, it's a mistake. But if you make it into a habit, that's completely different. That's completely different. It's not grace is not a license to sin. And this is what the hyper grace gospel, once saved, always saved, it's false. It's truly false. So there's a posting I, I, I uh, reposted on Facebook. Jeremiah Johnson had a dream. The Lord gave Jeremiah Johnson a dream not long ago. Arlo, stop it. The Lord gave Jeremiah Johnson a dream not long ago of all these pastors that were in hell. And... And, and then there were people that received deliverance that went to hell. And Jeremiah Johnson asked the Lord, why are there pastors in hell? And why are there people that receive deliverance and miracle healings in hell? And the Lord told Jeremiah Johnson, the reason they're in hell was because they didn't teach people to repent. And the people that received their miracles and deliverance did not repent. They went right back into the sin because they weren't taught that if you live in willful sin, you're not going to inherit heaven. You're, you're not headed to heaven if you're living in sin. You have to repent, come out from among them, and be separate. That's in your Bible. So, so again, like this, this, like you could be doing, again, what does it say in Matthew 7? They cast out demons. They, I'm talking about casting out demons. That's deliverance. That's miracle healings that come with deliverance. They prophesied. That's prophecy. And then the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. And the book of Judah describes people that are spirit, that, that are twice dead. That's referring to a spiritual death. They believed in God. So no, it's, it's definitely not once saved, always saved. Th those people did not repent. That's why repent means to not sin anymore. You just you're not. You don't sin. You don't look at porn. You don't. You don't have uh, premarital relationships that are not marriage. Arlo, you gotta stop biting this box, buddy. I don't want you eating cardboard. No. So 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 repent means to sin no more. When Jesus healed people, he said, "Sin no more, lest something worse shall come upon you." So if if someone receives deliverance from demons. And they, and they go right back into sin, it'll get worse. They're going to get more demons. Seven times worse. So that's exactly what Matthew chapter 12 says in the Bible. When an unclean spirit goes out, they're going to come back. Here. So here's something else I want to talk about with demons. Praying to the saints is idolatry, is what it is. You're not, no, one's, no one should be praying to angels. No one should be praying to Mary. No one should be praying to um, the saints. You know, talking to talking to the dead, things like that. You talk to Jesus. Why? He's alive. He's resurrected. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now they're laying down. Here they are. Look at those boys. He's chewing cardboard. Oh my goodness, you guys chewed up my earphones too. 
Wow. Wow, goodness gracious. Yep, that earphone's done for. Well, there goes that. <clears throat> Life of dogs. But yes, if, if someone if someone um if someone goes through deliverance and you return to sin, those demons that left you are coming back seven times worse. This is why it's 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 you've got to that's why a lot of people don't like that too. I've had people tell me like, you know, well, oh, well, if I have to repent, then you know, I'm I'm not going to I don't I'm not going to go through with you. I'll go to someone else that'll cast the demons out. And if that's the mindset, then you're going to get freedom for a day or two maybe, but the the unclean spirits, those familiar demonic spirits, they'll they'll they'll, they'll, they'll they may gladly leave for a moment, but if you go right back into sin, then you've misunderstood the gospel. You haven't heard the whole message. That's why people can get healed. That's how people can get, um, all right, Arlo, I'll let you out. Come on. So the way you get demons cast out is you stop sinning and you forgive everybody that's hurt you. You have to forgive everybody that's hurt you. Step one, forgive everybody. If someone's bitter, if you're walking in unforgiveness, if you're wounded, that gives the demons a legal right to be there. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says that an undeserved curse cannot land. It will flutter over you like a sparrow. So a curse, there you go, a curse, a demon. It's, it's, a, it's a cursed spirit. <clears throat> so if someone, if someone is walking in unforgiveness, you know, the Bible says to be headed to heaven, you have to forgive everybody that's ever hurt you. It says in Matthew chapter 6, if, if you don't forgive everyone that's hurt you, your father in heaven can't forgive you. So you have to, for one, it's unforgiveness is the first step to receiving true deliverance. And then step two is Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you all authority to, com- to, cast, uh, to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the means of the enemy so that nothing shall by any means hurt you. So you can command your own demons to go, but they're not going to leave unless you stop sinning. The reason they're there is, is, is because of A, unforgiveness, or B, sin. And if there's unforgiveness, then there's sin, because unforgiveness is a sin. So once you cover the base of unforgiveness, and you forgive everybody, now you repent, which means you stop sinning. If you have relationships in your life that are causing you to sin, you might have to cut them out. And, and that's, you know, that's probably like one of the hardest things, is letting go of the wrong people. And that's something God's been talking to me about, letting go of people in your life that are holding you back. You can't, you know... God gives people time to repent and humble themselves before the Lord. But if someone chooses to be uh, proud, God says in, or the word of God says in James chapter 4 that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if, you, if, you're, if you're not humble, if you're proud and you're walking in pride because you're wounded, then that person is choosing not to walk with God because they've refused to humble themselves. So, you know, what ends up happening is, is a lot of times people get in relationships and they would call it a narcissistic relationship or narcissistic abuse, but really, someone that's narcissistic or behaves narcissistic, that's a demonic presence. They have a demonic spirit, and it can also be a stronghold in their mind where they think that you get, they get a religious uh, mindset where they twist scripture and say that you can't leave me because, you know, we're married or something like that. Well, that's not true either because God doesn't let people sit around and get abused in a relationship where you're getting wounded over and over again by a person because they're walking in unforgiveness or they're refusing to humble themselves and they've got pride. Yes, if someone's in an abusive marriage, what will end up happening, if someone is, has a religious spirit or you go to a religious church and the pastor says, oh, you can't divorce, God hates divorce. Yes, God hates divorce, but God doesn't want someone to die prematurely because they're in a narcissistic, abusive relationship. That's entirely different. Someone that's abusing you privately behind closed doors, you know, they'll oftentimes use and twist and manipulate scripture into saying, you can't divorce me because God hates divorce. Well, the truth of the matter is, is yes, God does hate divorce, but God doesn't want you to suffer and be put into unforgiveness or you lose your salvation because you're with the wrong person that's headed down the wrong path how can two walk together except they be in agreement on where they are headed so if if someone if someone wants to go their own way because they refuse to humble themselves then that's their option god will honor someone's free will especially if they're not sincere you know so sometimes what will happen if someone behaves narcissistically which it, it's usually the spirit of Jezebel is what that really is. It's a Jezebel spirit. It's religious. It's a religious spirit. It can quote scripture. They can pray. 
but but what will end up happening is is they'll say things like you can't leave me because we're married so now i can do whatever i want that's what that demon's going to say someone can you lose salvation that's that's probably a little you know i don't know galatians 5:19 is really my reference that i'm making how can you lose salvation if you're fighting with someone and you're screaming and you're arguing because they're violent Galatians 5.19 says people that walk in the flesh don't will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you make it a habitual habit to stay in offense, you, you, you get what I'm saying? I hope that makes sense. Galatians 5.19 is, is really, yeah, so don't scream and argue. And again, though, if, if you're with someone that screams and argues and they're violent, I mean, it's hard to really like shut your mouth and, and take it sometimes. And you've got to get away from them, which is... is, is um, establishing boundaries you know but again like so so what i would encourage anyone in a toxic abusive relationship to do is is pray for the person but go to the lord and ask him for a prophetic word regarding that relationship because god can say hopefully you can hear me Let's see. all right you can hear me now arlo drop it i had a phone call sorry my phone cut out for a moment arlo you're going wild buddy chewing stuff but yeah, so if someone's in a relationship that's abusive, you know, and this person's betraying you and they're violating the covenant of marriage, they're violating what a marriage is supposed to be, they're unfaithful, they're adulterous, they're doing things privately behind your back or working against you. Well, I like how Kevin Zadai says it. When he went to heaven, he saw that it's unheard of to work against another Christian. It's, it's virtually unheard of to work against another Christian. Like people who make it to heaven... They don't have a habit. They don't have make it a habit to work against another Christian. So I have to be real careful too. You know, I don't gossip about people, you know, things like that. And I, 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 you know, that's fruit of the flesh. It says that there's things that God hates. And true love is when you learn to hate what God hates, which is exactly what it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's definitely important. Get down, get down. It's definitely important to, to, you know, if someone's causing you to sin is what I'm talking about. If you're with somebody that's causing you to live in sin, and they're causing you to stumble, and they're causing you to sin, that's, that's what I'm talking about. People that make sin a habitual habit don't inherit the kingdom of God. I'm talking about willful sin. Willful sin. Well, if, if you're with someone that's not walking with God and you're with the wrong person, you know. And then Hebrews 10.26 is a warning written to, written to people that, that remain in willful sin and they never repent. And it says there's an expectation of fiery judgment. So, again, it's the, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. So if someone's wondering, well, how, how can you not inherit salvation, read Galatians chapter 5.19. Galatians 5.19, it makes it very clear. People who make it a habit sinning, walk, what's walking in the flesh, they don't hear it, the kingdom of God. Because it says the carnal man, the carnal mind is an enmity of God. So to be carnally minded is to fulfill the fruit of the flesh. What is flesh? Lust, pornography, arguing, screaming, fighting, um, living a disobedient lifestyle, disobedient to, to God. <clears throat> That's why when I hear people saying, oh, but we're all sinners, brother, da, 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 and I'm like, man, I'm concerned for you guys. I'm concerned when I hear that. I, I mean, I say it out of love, but people that think that they're a sinner, then if they tell themselves they'll always be a sinner, then they're just going to go ahead and live in sin because they think it's okay. But Hebrews 10.26 is a warning written to people that think that that's okay to do. You know, you can't live a life full of sin and expect to get into heaven. There's heaven's not there's not vile people in heaven. So the behavior of the self life is obvious: sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God. You know, a relationship could be idolatrous, an idolatrous relationship, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments. So if you're with someone that is senselessly causing you to argue all of the time, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, 
being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? That's referring to salvation. That's salvation. So the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all of its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. So what he's saying is if you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit and you're walking in the Spirit of God, then you're, you're, there's no law against that. That means you're not in sin if you're walking in the Spirit. Uh, so in Second Corinthians 10, it says that the weapons of our mor- warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. So a stronghold is any time that you get a thought, anything that you believe that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, that is the word of God. You have to pull those thoughts down. So you have to bring them in. You have to arrest that thought, bring it into captivity. It's not a sin. Just so you know, it's not a sin to have a thought. It's not a sin to have a bad thought, a sexual thought. It's when you dwell on it, and then it, it, and then you start to like allow it to get into your heart, and you start like coveting, or you start like, you start, you know, looking at pornography or something. Like you can have a temptation, and you, and you, and you, um, you can you cast that thought down in, in the name of Jesus. So. <clears throat> That's what you have to do to put on strongholds. So again, though, another thing when it comes to strongholds and into having, having, uh, believing lies and things like that, um, you know, when it comes to that, when it comes to that type of thing, it's really important to know the word of God and not just rely on a pastor and not just rely on someone in the fivefold to teach you everything. That's why it's very important for us all to actually understand and know the word of God. So so if you hear something or someone tells you something, then you know how to take the thought captive because you can judge it against the word of God. So if you have a, a if you don't have a strong understanding of the word of God, then it's a lot harder to take down a thought captive. Also, you know, it's it's hard to understand what is truth and what is a lie if you don't know the word of God. So so no, there's not many paths to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He is the door, he is the truth, he is the vine, and, and all we are is branches and we're servants in our Father's kingdom. So so um <clears throat> All right, I'm going to have to block this person. Awesome. I think they've been blocked. When people come in here to teach, um, or, or they try to come in here and, and teach something, or, or, or distract, or divide, I go make your own channel you know i don't i don't need um i don't need someone to come in here and help me teach at all by the way so just you know i'm not here to argue not here to debate not here to um create you know you know controversy just here to speak the truth in love um and which is telling people about repentance um the importance of repentance, what true repentance and humility looks like. So another thing that's real important, that's real big, is the Lord had me research false humility, which is a, a still a form of pride. So people, so people, um, people that are walking in pride, um, the God God opposes them. It says that in, in James four. So I'll give you an example of false humility. Some people can't receive a compliment. If someone can't receive a compliment and they and they and they're like, no, I'm ugly, you know, things like that, and they put themselves down, they don't even know who they are in Christ because they're made in the image of God. I have to clean up this chat real quick. <clears throat> so people that are carnally minded and they're led by the flesh, love to argue and debate. That's what Galatians 5.19 is talking about. Senseless arguments. Also, it says in 1 Timothy 4, 
that there are people that love to heap themselves up having many teachers because in the last days they they want their ears tickled they want to hear what makes them feel feel good so so basically um to walk in the spirit you just you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh you don't let people this is another thing that's important you know Kevin Zadai Dr. Kevin Zadai talks about this that uh people that are carnally minded uh, I don't allow people that are carnal to to speak into my life. If you're not led by the Holy Spirit, then you know what are you what are you led by? I, you know these are just things that to think about. So people that are carnally minded love to sow discord. The Book of Jude mentions that. I believe that. Um, let's see, I'm going to read Second Peter chapter two, which is also reiterated in Jude. Second Peter two. I like Second Peter. <clears throat> in the last, uh, in Second Peter chapter two, verse one: In the past, there arose false prophets among God's people, just as there will continue to be false teachers who will secretly infiltrate in your midst to divide you bringing with them their destructive heresies. They will even deny the master who paid the price for them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow immoral lifestyles because of these corrupt false teachers. The way of truth will be slandered. They are only in it for themselves, ready to exploit you for their own gain through their cunning arguments. Their condemnation has been a long time coming, but their destruction does not slumber or sit idly by, for it is sure to come. Does that sound like once saved, always saved? People that will preach a message that makes you feel good because it brings in a lot of money and a lot of people love to hear it. In the process, they're they're perverting God's grace to, to follow immoral lifestyle. If you believe once saved, always saved, the problem with once saved, always saved, sure, a lot of people, once they're saved, they're always going to be saved. But that once saved, always saved denies that people have free will. It denies that people can fall back, turn away from the faith, that they can deny God, that they can do all kinds of terrible things. And in Galatians 5.19, it gives a list of behavior characteristics that if these people make this a habitual habit, that those people don't inherit the kingdom of God. So I just want to prophesy over everybody here in the name of Jesus that, that um, if you're at the sound of my voice, that I want you to know Father God has an amazing plan for your life. God does love you. It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And God is merciful, and that's what God's grace is. It is time to repent. It is time to repent. It's time to repent from all of our sins, all in righteousness, okay? So in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare that everybody here will be a good tree that uh, bears good fruit, that they will receive the word of God and they will bear good fruit in keeping with godly repentance. In the name of Jesus, I command every demonic presence, thought, mindset, stronghold to break off their life by the power of blood of the blood of Jesus Christ. The power of the blood of the Lamb speaks over everybody here. You all have a divine inheritance in Jesus Christ and you have a book written about you in heaven according to Psalm 139 verse 16. So in the name of Jesus, Jesus, I decree and declare that that there um, that any of these lies that have come against you through false teaching or, or 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 just religion or bad doctrine would be broken right now by the power of the blood of Jesus, and that and that all who are here right now with ears to hear, they will be set free by the power of the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Yeah, a lot of times people when there's a lot of demons present. That's it. You're gonna people get nauseous and sh sweat and tremor and shake. That's the thing about sin, though, is you know sin, sin, sin has consequences. And, and living in sin, people have a lot of demons. Like when I went to Isaiah Saldivar a weekend ago um, in Orlando, there were um, so many Christians there that had demons, and they just dropped to their knees on the floor, and their demons were screaming out of their mouth. And like so, a lot of these like uh, these t 
teachers that preach once saved, always saved. They preach that Christians can't have demons and stuff. If they would just go to one outdoor revival in the park, they would see that it's real. And and I, I believe some of these people must. They have to know. But they're, they're, what it is is people hold on to their religious doctrine because it makes you feel good. It tickles your ears to think that you can do anything. But Jesus never taught that. Peter never taught that. Paul never taught that. Nowhere in your Bible does it say once saved, always saved, just live a wicked lifestyle and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It, it, God honors people's free will. We have to be intentional with how we live. And, and you can grieve the Holy Spirit. So, And if we live the wrong type of lifestyle, if we live the wrong type of lifestyle, then and, and that's how you people grieve the Holy Spirit, according to Galatians 5.16. <clears throat> It says in Second Peter um, chapter 2, verse 4, Now don't forget, God had no pity for the angels when they sinned, but threw them into the lowest, darkest dungeon of gloom and locked them in chains where they are firmly held unto the judgment of torment. And he did not spare the former world in the days of Noah when he sent a flood to destroy a depraved world, although he protected Noah Noah, the preacher of righteousness, along with seven members of his family. So, so God loves justice. God loves righteousness. And, and God will, and here's something else. This is prophetically, I just want to tell you this, that when you truly repent and come out of the world and you allow the Lord, the Holy Spirit to move into your life and you submit your will to God, God will take you and put you on display for the whole world to see because you you go you'll carry his glory and and everywhere you go you you know there will be deliverance when you pray people get set free when you cast out demons the demons respond and they truly go and people feel that presence when under the anointing when you when you pray but at the same time you know I'm just preaching to myself you know I can't be someone that just does miracles and cast out demons but doesn't teach repentance that's how people end up in hell is they cast out demons, but they don't repent. They don't. They themselves don't repent. They live in sin. Or if you receive a miracle healing and you receive the demons being cast out, but then you go right back into sin, well, that didn't do you any good, you know. So people have to understand salvation. Salvation is you receive Jesus Christ in your heart. You confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You ask Him to, to the, the the Holy Spirit to come in and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Ask Heavenly Father for your prayer language, but you repent for your sins. You repent. You repent. And and there the the, the gospel there's there is a message these people will say, some of these teachers call it the gospel of grace. And they say, Oh, well, we just it's grace, you know. Repentance means to just confess Jesus with your mouth. And they believe that you don't need to repent from your sin because you're always going to be a sinner. So I hope that hopefully what um, I believe what I'm saying is going to is going to fall on good ground here. So you have to repent from your sin. That's that's that is the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And then the other thing I I, uh, I always want to enable people is you know like so so I want everyone here to know you have. You have um, all authority to cast out demons and to prophesy and to pray. Everybody here can do that. It's not just for the fivefold. Even if you're not part of the fivefold or you don't have a title or you don't even serve at a church, you can cast out demons. Like um, this is one of the things that you know. I, I heard Isaiah Saldivar say this in Orlando. He says, "You know what good is it if I have a million followers?" But I've become an idol for people because they only want me to pray for them or they only want to receive deliverance through me. He says, you know, Kevin Zadai says pretty much the very same thing. This is about you. This is about you. This is about your walk with the Lord. And, and when I come on and teach and pray, I just want people to know they have that same authority. Now, with that said, if, if you go to cast out demons and they don't listen to you and they won't leave... Well, then there's a whole nother, there's a, there's another issue there and that needs to be addressed. So if demons aren't listening to you, if they're not responding to you, you have to check and see, am I in the faith? Am I submitted to Christ Jesus? Am I submitted to the Lord? And, and again, so if someone's living this, I'll make this clear what this looks like. If someone's living in habitual sin and they go to cast demons out, they may not listen because the demon can turn around. So I, I'll, I'll tell you all a story I heard one day. There was a pastor that um, 
It could be doubt. That's what happened in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus was talking about unbelief. He says this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. In Mark 9, 29, he's not talking about deliverance and from demons. The problem was if you go down to verse 20, Jesus told the disciples, oh, how faithless you are. You're faithless. You don't have any faith. Just like it says in James chapter 1, verse 6, the ambivalent man, how can you accept to receive from the Lord if you're double-minded, if you're going to and fro in what you believe? So when, so when he's referring to fasting, that some types don't come out by nothing but fasting. He's not saying you have to fast to cast out a demon. It's when you fast, it repostures your heart back to God. You'll be full of the faith. So if someone's not full of faith, if they're not certain if they can do it because they're double-minded, then yes, fasting is exactly how you would want to handle that. If there's double-mindedness or if you're weak in faith, for sure fast. That's what you need to do. You need to fast. But once you've cast out demons, you and, and demons know who ha, who has demons know who you are when you've done deliverance. They I mean they know who's walking in their authority, and the demons will know who's not as well. So um, everybody can do deliverance, and everybody can do self deliverance. But but if demons aren't responding to you, um, you got to do a self check. Check your own fruit. Come to the Lord. And ask, um, ask the Lord for a prophetic word. Ask him to confirm what you've heard. Um, ask him for a dream. Ask him for a prophetic word. You can pray in tongues and journal. When I journal, that's, that's one way the Lord speaks to me. I, when I write things down, I write down prayers. And the Lord will start speaking back to me after I've done a prayer. So that's, a, that's prophetic. That's a prophetic gifting of the Holy Spirit. Paul said in the New Testament that I wish that you all would seek to prophesy above all else. So when you pray in tongues, what will happen is, is if, if you've never heard from the Lord, start praying in the Holy Spirit. Start praying in tongues. But yes, you definitely have to believe in your own authority. But this is what I, another point I want to make about the authority is if demons don't respond to you, it could be that you're double-minded. If you're new in the faith, you've never done deliverance, maybe you're not sure. You definitely should fast if you feel weak in your faith. But if, if, there's, if there's another situation and you've fasted and demons don't respond to you, are you living in sin? Are you, are you living in, in some type of, is there immorality in your life? Are you living with, um, are you having sex outside of marriage? There's so, are you looking at pornography and then trying to cast out demons? I'm just throwing out examples because if someone's living in sin and they have demons, how are you going to cast something out that won't leave you? <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much what I'm saying. So uh, I'll give you an example. I heard a story where there was a pastor, and you know, a lot of times people with a position high up can can get into pride and think just because they have a title that these demons are going to respond. I'll be on, I'll be the first one to say demons don't care how many degrees are on your wall. They don't care about your annual income or how many TV shows you're on. Demons respond to authority. So, so if you're looking at pornography or you're having an affair on your wife with your secretary or something, and you go into a deliverance session and there's someone there manifesting demons and they need deliverance, and you're praying for this person, the demon in that person may look at you and say, "Hey, I'm inside of you too," and then pounce on you. It's like the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. You know, they tried to cast out demons, and the demons pounced on them because they had <laughs> they didn't know who this person was, and they recognized the they didn't they weren't walking in authority to Jesus Christ. So so to be submitted into authority of Jesus means you obey God's word. You're obedient. You're a servant of God. All you are is a servant. You know, a prophet, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher, uh doesn't matter what fivefold a ministry you are, uh you're still a, you're you're a servant. We're servants of God. We're servants in our Father's kingdom. Amen. <clears throat> this is a good one. Second Peter chapter 3. Actually, no, we're going to go. The arrogance of false teachers. This is good. I'm still in Second Peter 2. This is verse uh, 10. And this is especially applies to those who live their lives despising authorities and who abandon themselves to chasing the depraved lusts of the flesh. They are willfully arrogant and insolent, unafraid to insult the glorious ones. Yet even angels who are greater than they in power and strength do not dare slander them before the Lord. These individuals are nothing but brute beasts, irrational creatures born in the wild to be caught and destroyed, and they will perish like beasts. They, prof they are professional insulters who slander whatever they don't understand, and in their destruction they will be destroyed. For all the evil they have done will come crashing down on them. They consider it their great pleasure to, ca to carouse in broad daylight. When they come to your love feast, they are but stains and blemishes. 
reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you. They are addicted to adultery with eyes that are insatiable, with sins that never end. They seduce the vulnerable and are experts in their greed. They are but the children of a curse. This is applying to today, you guys. This isn't just a long time ago. This is today. This is talking about. We're in Second Peter chapter 2. That was verse 14. I'll go into 15. The example of Balaam. It's talking about they have wandered off the main road and have gone astray because they are prophets who love profit. They love money. The wages they are earn the wages they earn are by wrong wrongdoing. They are following the example of Balaam, son of Beor, who was rebuked for evil by a donkey and capable of speech, yet that spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are dried up riverbeds, waterless clouds pushed along by stormy winds, the deepest darkness of gloom has been prepared for them. They spout off with their grandiose, impressive nonsense. Consumed with the lust of the flesh, they lure back into sin those who recently escaped from their error. This is Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17. They promise others freedom, yet they themselves are slaves to corruption, for people are slaves to whatever overcomes them. That's powerful. Very powerful. We're talking about people who will teach, right? These are talking about people who will teach and, and, and preach the word. But they're, what they've done is they've perverted God's grace into a license, teaching people, well, we're all sinners, so we're just going to stay in sin. Why not? That's basically what this is. This is a, that's, that goes right along with what we're learning here in Second Peter chapter 2, is that these people have perverted the word of God into, and, and they, they get, it even says right here, they... Um, they promise others freedom, yet they themselves are slaves to corruption. So get this, they're living in corruption. What's corruption? What does Galatians 5.19 say? It's the lust of the flesh. People that look at porn, people that are doing all these, these sinful behaviors consistently, like willful sin I'm talking about. Premeditated sin. These people are slaves to whatever overcomes them. Those who escape the corruption... The corrupting forces of this world system through the experience of knowing about our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, then go back into entanglement with them and are defeated by them, becoming worse off than they were to start with. Now this is verse 21. It would have been much better for them never to have experienced the way of righteousness than to know it and then turn away from the sacred obligation that was given to them. They become illustrations of the true proverb, a dog will return to his own vomit and a washed pig to its rolling in the mud. So what, what this is talking about is people that, that get free from sin and they're, put, and they're on the right path, they're on the narrow path, and then they make, they, they make a willful decision to go back into sin. That's why it says they will become the illustration of the proverb, a dog will return to its own vomit and a washed pig to its rolling in the mud. Now, this is an interesting par parallel. This is a very interesting parallel to what you will see in, uh, in Matthew 12. If someone gets set free from a demon or many demons, as an example, and the temple, meaning your body, your life, isn't swept clean, that demonic spirit is going to return with seven more spirits wicked than he and see if the temple's not swept clean, which means, are you living right? Have you put to death the flesh? Are you still living in sin? Because the consequences of sin, of the wages of sin is death eventually, but, but the temporary effects of sin is that you're going to have demons. And this is such an underpreached message. Like this is the message you will not hear this in a lukewarm church, people. I just want to set you free today. So in the name of Jesus, I just decree and declare that the blood of Jesus is washing over everybody here from their eyes to their ear gates, that their eyes and their will be full of light, that their, their hearts will be full of the revelation light of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit would move upon them. I prophesy in the name of Jesus that they will have dreams at night and, and prophesy according to Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and that their children would be saved and that their relatives would be saved because their lives would become a living testimony to the goodness in God of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, 
a lot of us got into churches. So, and this is a big teaching right here in Second Peter three to swallow this, like what I'm talking about. A a dog will return to his own vomit and wash the pig to its rolling in the mud. Here's something I've noticed: once you, once you get free from sin and you're walking in the spirit, Kevin, Z- Doctor Kevin Zadai teaches about this as well. That when you're walking in the spirit, the way that the demonic now tries to operate is they're studying you. There's demons that are far off in the spirit realm and they're watching you to see, do you have a weakness? Is it, is it beautiful women? Is it beautiful men? Is it, is it greed? They're studying you. These demons are called familiar spirits because they're familiar to you. Like think of the root Latin of the word familia, la familia, familiar. They're, they're, these are generational demons that studied your mom, your dad, your grandparents. Amen. Romans chapter uh, 12. One and two, standing in agreement. So when they, when these demons study you, they're they're looking to see, do you have a weakness? And when you pray in tongues, it's like a it's like a, a blast goes off in the spirit. Demons can't stand it. That's why, like, um, you know, there's 86 people in here. If I just started praying in tongues and, and just doing nothing but praying in tongues and then prophesying you would almost instantly see in the chat room, almost every time this I do that, you'll start seeing a religious spirit and religious demons start manifesting because they can't stand tongues because they don't understand that gift. They don't understand that gift. They can't hear in the spirit. They cannot hear what, what they can't hear between what the Holy Spirit is saying into heaven. They, they don't have the ability to understand or comprehend that. They can't understand it, so they fight tongues. That's why religious spirits will fight tongues every single time. <laughs> and that's another reason why you get into uh, some of these lukewarm churches, lukewarm mega churches, and then all they talk about is love and grace, but you don't hear about the power of the blood of Jesus. That makes demons uncomfortable. You don't hear about repentance, holiness, righteousness. Well, Why? Because there might be people that have demons that get upset and walk out because they don't want to hear that. They only want to hear, once saved, always saved, I'm loved no matter what. Yes, you are loved no matter what. And nothing can separate you from God's love. But God loves the people that end up throwing themselves in hell. That's the truth. People have free will. So in the name of Jesus, I just I take all authority over any uh, demonic presence that's stealing this person's dreams or causing them to have a hard time remembering. I command anything that's not from uh, the Lord God, Jesus Christ, to break right now by the power of the blood of Jesus and that that person's dreams would be restored and that their communication with Father God in heaven would be perfect to the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I went through addiction too. Um, I was addicted to Adderall, uh, gabapentin, Vyvanse, Xanax. Uh, I was addicted to cocaine at one point. Not not long term, very short term. I mean, I had a marijuana. I my past is. I mean, my past was like the, one of the worst. So, God set me free from all of it. Glory to God. He set me free from all of it. And uh, I can relate to addiction. So the way you do this is is you handle this by pr- in prayer. You come to the Lord and ask him to take each addiction away specifically. And um, if, I, if, I w- if I would have done one thing different when I was fighting addiction, I'm going to tell you what I would do differently now if I, could, if I did it over again. I would have been seeking the Lord for a prophetic word on how to overcome the addiction. So in other words, what I'm saying, I hope this makes sense, is that when I prayed to God, I never got quiet and listened for God to speak to me. A lot of people miss this, so don't miss this. Prayer is not one-way communication. Prayer is two-way communication. It's you pray, and then you listen. And if you have a hard time hearing, if, you, if, you're, if your dreams aren't clear, if you're not getting a lot of dreams, pray in tongues. If you're having a hard time hearing from the Lord, you can journal. You can write down your prayers and then get in God's presence, pray in tongues, put on some praise and worship music, and just rest in his presence. And um, if you can, you know, Jane, this is another thing. So if you've got addiction really bad, and you're struggling, and you feel like there's there's a very 
demonic presence there, right? If you're struggling with demons, and, and, and if there's addiction, there's demons. I'll, I'll, I'm a very blunt person, okay? I'm, I'm telling you the truth. This is part of my personal testimony, and this is speaking from experience, not just textbook knowledge. I'm, I'm talking from my heart, from my experience. You can get in the presence of godly people that, that walk in the, in, the, in the light of Jesus Christ. If you can find a spirit-filled church, James chapter 5, verse 16 in your Bible says that God hears the heartfelt prayers of a godly believer. So when people come together and lay hands on you, you can see instantaneous power released in prayer. You can get an instant deliverance. An instant deliverance. You can get instant deliverance sometimes having a group of spirit-filled believers pray for you and it'll break because there's an instantaneous power that's released through the prayer of a heartfelt godly believer, people who fear God, who walk in the fear of the Lord, people that have wisdom from God because they fear him and they're in his presence all the time. And then you will become like those people. And, and, and another important thing is, is I, I never want anyone to go without hearing this. We all need to be discipled. I'm a student of Warrior Note School of Ministry. And I, I don't work for them. Um, they don't pay me to say this. I'm, I'm just telling you, it's very beneficial for me to have someone that's very gifted in the discernment of the Holy Spirit that also hears from the Lord. So so for me, I already know Kevin Zadai, Dr. Kevin Zadai, he's an amazing teacher. He, he's who I sit under right now, and I have been for some time, and I'm very appreciative to God for his teachings. He's a gift. Um, so one thing that you don't want to do is 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 come to come to God like an ATM. Coming to God like an ATM. And this is something I had to repent over. I just wanted to have a business. I just wanted to be financially successful. I just wanted to have my own pickup truck to take my dog to the beach and, and just maybe travel sometimes. But then I realized, like, no, God has a bigger plan for my life. It involves a lot more than, like, materialistic. That stuff doesn't matter. So we can't just get our healing and get our deliverance and then go on our own way. Like you got to change how you are. Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 is what is what uh th- that's the scripture that comes into me in my heart right now. It says you must prove your repentance by a changed life. That's a powerful scripture to really meditate on that. And a lot of people want to know, well how do we live a life that satisfies God? If you go to Romans chapter 12 and another good scripture to memorize is Romans 8. The very first verse of Romans 8 says, The case is now closed against you. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So once you come to Christ and you've been delivered, you if you start thinking guilty thoughts, if you start feeling ashamed of your past, if you start hearing a voice tell you you're guilty, you did something 10 years ago, you're in trouble, blah, 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 blah. The devil is a liar. He's going to try to see, can he get you to believe a lie? So uh, I'm going to read Romans 12. But Paul does say, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. So you do have to ch- check your own fruit. Uh, make sure you're living a life of, of, of humility and not pride. And people who have been wounded in their childhood, rejected by parents, re- uh, rejected by loved ones. Typically, I'm speaking from experience again, I was walking in pride for um, most of my life. God And, and God's goodness and his mercy... He forgave me, right? God forgave me. It says in 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive you for all unrighteousness, all of your sins. And then Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says, He will remember your sins and iniquities no more. So uh, true repentance is, is you turn from rebellion, you repent of pride, you humble yourself before the Lord, and then He will lift you up. This is what Romans chapter... Oh, I went to Revelation 12. Whoops. Sorry. I was talking and trying to read at the same time. Last night in my sleep, something happened to me. I'll tell you guys, I was preaching in my sleep. I was I went to go to sleep and and I and so I hear in the spirit and I could hear my spirit man preaching. It was like I could hear the Holy Spirit speaking through me even after I went to lay down. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I was preaching in my sleep. And then I've had times where I've, I've woken up at like 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning and you've got a revelation in your spirit. Like, oh, the, ba- the babes in Christ need to hear about repentance. Okay, all right, Lord. And like you, you wake up and it's like, you know, okay. and like suddenly you know something you didn't know before. And like it's like you're, you're getting a download while you're asleep because your eyes and your ears are awakened. Oh, there's a good scripture in Job. Um, if anyone has it, 
posted in the chat. There's a scripture in Job where he says, God opens their uh, the eyes of their heart in their sleep. I'll find it real fast. I'm going to find it real fast. Um, um, God opens the, the eyes of the heart in sleep. Job. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, thoughts. Job thirty three fourteen through 16. For God speaketh once, yeah, twice, yet man perceives it not. And then also in Genesis 20, verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art, a, art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken is another man's, for she is a man's wife, another man's wife. Also in Job 4, um, Job 4, 13. I'm pulling it up on my computer. Amid disquieting dreams in the night when deep sleep falls on people, um, NLT says, It came to me in a disturbing night vision when people are in deep sleep. So Job had the revelation that that God would speak to you in your dreams. So, But, but also God wants to communicate with you on a deeper level. Is it glitching? Yeah, Job 4.13. That's right. That's correct. Is the is this live stream glitching? On my end, it's not. You you said you have problems with painkillers, and you've actually recorded a growl outside of your house. That definitely sounds demonic. And yes, um, I have heard of demons growling. Demons are, and as a matter of fact, I've been in deliverance sessions with people where I'm casting demons out, and the demons growl. They're that's the people make demonic faces. It's very real. It's very real. Um, painkillers, you know, I'll pray for you right now. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare the blood of Jesus Christ over Mario uh, Rodriguez. I decree and declare that that spirit of addiction, that slumbering idol spirit that was on an assignment from the pit of hell will break off of him by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and that you have a divine appointment with Mario in the name of Jesus. The Lord has wonderful plans for your life. You have a good and expected end. That's what it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has mercy on you. He loves you, that the blood of Jesus washes over your heart, that your heart be flooded with the revelation light of Jesus. Jesus Christ, and that the blood of Jesus washes over Mario from the crown of his head to the bottom of his feet. Lord, I ask that in the name of Jesus, you'd send the Holy Spirit to his house. Touch him in the night. Touch him in the morning. Give him revelation while he sleeps of your wisdom, of your love, of your grace, and your compassion, Lord. I thank you in advance for that wonderful testimony that Mario will have to give about how you set him free from pain and pain medication and addiction in Jesus' name. All glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. Sleeping pills, you said. Sleeping pills. Um, I have I knew someone that was on, um, what was the one they take to make you sleep? But if you don't fall asleep right away, you hallucinate. I think it's called, uh, oh gosh. It's been around forever. That the, the medication I'm thinking of, it's been around like 30, 40 years. Maybe that's it. I don't know if there's another there's another one, Sarah, that's just like that. But I know what you're talking about. That's a that God is good because he get, he gives us time to repent. He gives us time to to accept his forgiveness and he gives us free will. God is good because everyone take is born into sin. We're we're falling into a sinful nature. So God gives us time to come to know him and he doesn't just send us into hell. I mean, uh, listen, we have a free will whether we choose to receive Jesus Christ or not, but we are all starting out in sin and we need a savior. We need the blood of Jesus to wash over our sins, to forgive us for all of our unrighteousness, all of our iniquities. Otherwise, the cup of wrath is building as we live. And a lot of times people think, well, I can just live in sin because nothing bad's happened yet. That cup is building, my friend. That cup is building, my friend. So as the case of sin is building against you, it's the, the, I'll tell you, the, the good, the best, th- here's the good news. You can turn yourself into Jesus Christ right now. He accepts you. He receives you. He forgives you. The goodness of God leads men to repentance, right? He has mercy on you. But you can know Jesus now as Savior, or we will all know him as judge in the end. 
because man is only appointed to live once and then we die and then we then we go all stand before God and we're going to give an account of every good or bad b- deed we did in this body and we need the blood of Jesus to wash over the bad to take it away and just so you know that um here's what happened yeah Jesus Christ restores you amen amen Chris that's exactly right Jesus Christ restores you so regardless of where you're at in life and whatever's going on, you turn yourself into the Lord and you humble yourself before him, he's going to build you back up. He's going to build you back up. <clears throat> so everyone everyone has had sin. Everyone starts out in sin. In other words, when you don't know the word, I mean, you're, it, we're all carnal. Before we're born again, we're, we're trapped in sin. We're slaves of sin. Without the Holy Spirit, no one is free of sin. I just want to make this clear. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to overcome sin. That's what Galatians chapter 5 is saying. There's no law against such what? Love. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're walking in love. And then all the fruit of the Spirit is displaying on your life. That's what Galatians chapter 5 verses 21 through 23 is saying. But if someone is living in sin, according to Galatians 5 verse 19, and they make sin a habitual habit, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. They, 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 they're not going to get saved. They won't get into heaven because they disobeyed God. They rejected God. Jesus says in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll obey me. You'll keep my commandments. He also goes on to say later on in John 14, he who does not love me, does not keep my commands. He's not going to obey me. If you don't obey Jesus, you don't love him. He said that in John 14. Why am I sweating bad after you prayed for me? The demons. Those are the demons. People who have demons, when uh, when you, when uh, it's, the, you're, it's the anointing, the anointing causes those demons to, to manifest. So it'll cause you to sweat and pray. Sometimes people get sick and nauseous. Sometimes people cry. That's how you receive deliverance. Those are your demons leaving but to stay delivered, you got to repent. You got to turn from sin. You got to turn from sin. In other words, ask Jesus Christ to help you with whatever the sin is in your life. With whatever the sin is in your life, whatever sinful condition you're struggling with, there's no condemnation in Christ. I'm not condemning anyone. This is not a message of condemnation. This is reconciliation. And the way that we reconcile to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And the way that we do that is we come to Jesus Christ and confess with our mouth every sin. So if you're out there on the other end of this phone message, just listen and say to Jesus, Jesus, I confess and then name the sin. Pornography, addiction, drugs. Drugs, pills, is it uh, sexual relationships, out of marriage, whatever it is, confess it to Jesus, ask him to forgive you, and then ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and ask him to seal you with the blood of Jesus, and to place you on the path of holiness, and this is this is key to your breakthrough, you're going to get set free today, amen, in Jesus' name, when you ask the Lord when you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to take everything out of your life that's not from him, ask him to judge you. This is your. This is up to you, by the way. This is entirely up to you. I'm going to tell you. If you pray the prayer I'm about to tell you, you're going to see massive breakthrough in your life. But you got to be prepared. Change is coming if you pray like this. If you ask Jesus Christ to take everything out of your life that's not supposed to be there, that's exactly what you're going to get. Relationships, addictions, lust, pride, all those things people struggle with in the fleshly nature, ask Jesus Christ. Here's, here's what I personally did. I asked, I asked God, I asked Jesus Christ to judge me early. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, please judge me now so that I'm not judged later. I don't want to be judged with the world. I don't want to be living in sin when I, when I come face to face with Jesus at the end. I want Jesus Christ to look at me and say, my good and faithful servant, well done, who I am pleased with. Welcome in, servant. Come into heaven. Come into heaven. He said, narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. That's what Jesus said. Yes, so, and that's another thing. Thank you for mentioning, um, God bless you. You said you cry during praise and worship. That's a great thing. I, when, when, when the Holy Spirit's presence is uh, super, super strong, sometimes when I give my testimony and pray for people, sometimes I cry. And you can, and it's just the presence of God. I mean, my eyes are starting to water right now, so I'm just like, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to cry. 
Hallelujah. So I plead the blood of Jesus over this entire life. I command every demonic presence to break off their lives right now in the name of Jesus. I speak the blood of Jesus right now running from their head to their toes in the name of Jesus. I command the blood of Jesus right now to drive back uh, the demons, to drive back the evil, to drive back all darkness from their lives. I wash the blood of Jesus right now over their generations, over their bloodlines, over their children, over their mothers, their fathers others and their relatives. We sever the silver cords. We sever the ley lines of generational curses of witchcraft and Freemasonry of anywhere there was sorcery or blood sacrifices that were done over these people. We break all those curses right now by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. My hand, my hand was like starting to shake. That's hallelujah. I feel the power on that. The power of God. And sometimes when I pray, uh, deliverance prayers and and, and, and and you're pushing back darkness through prophecy by speaking by the spirit of God like that the internet connections sometimes will start trying to act up and it's Satan Satan is the is the God of this world he doesn't want people getting delivered and set free and this is the beauty of the gospel and this is the beauty of the power of the blood of Jesus is that there's no time or distance in the spirit realm there's no time or distance in the spirit realm so I just decree and declare the blood of Jesus over everybody here. I command every curse to break by the power of the blood of Jesus right now. The Spirit of God commands every curse to break by the power of the blood of Jesus. There is no curse that can stand up to the blood of Jesus. I command curses of sorcery, Freemasonry, witchcraft to be, to be broken right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. The people that are here today will have an amazing time testimony of being set free from addiction, being set free from curses, being set free from religion and bondage in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Amen. And amen. Someone said they need weight gain. Um, have you tried creatine? Just a thought. I, I, uh, I used to try to bulk and stuff like that and creatine helped me gain weight. Um, so I, and I, know it's, it's, I listen to Isaiah Saldivar preach sometimes, and I know he always says he needs to bulk up. But if you're if you need weight gain, um, I don't know what your situation is. But if you can do creatine, it, you might find uh, at GNC or find something on Amazon that could help you with that. But 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 for sure we can. Um, you said what is idolatry? Idolatry is when you put anything in front of God. It could be a relationship. It could be video games. It could be cigarette smoking, uh, which is a sin. And we shouldn't be doing things against our body. Um, and, and again, sanctification is not a one-time event. This is a day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. So like, if you struggle with sin today, you won't tomorrow. I just prophesy in Jesus' name. You're going to do better. Okay, So that's what sanctification is. You turn yourself into Jesus right now. Because none of us know. Listen, pr tomorrow is not promised to anybody. So why not turn ourselves into God right now in Jesus' name and say, this is what I struggle with, Lord. I confess my sins. I need to be forgiven for everything. I need a new life. I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need you to seal me with the blood of Jesus. To put in front of God is anything that you spend. You, you uh, uh, Okay, so here's a good example. What Whatever you serve is what you're a slave to. So if you spend more time, so if you're wondering what is idolatry, read Galatians chapter 5, 19 in your Bible. That's a good place to start. Idolatry is anything that you're putting in front of God. Anything that's more important to you than Jesus. <clears throat> so I'm not saying like you can't have a job or you can't work. But what I am saying is there's a lot of a lot of Christians that fall into lukewarmness and they never testify. They never give their testimony. They don't prophesy. They don't cast out demons. They don't pray for anyone. They don't help the sick, the homeless, the orphan, the widow. We have to count the cost. Amen. We have to do good works. Can demons know your thoughts or just observe you from the outside? Let's talk about that. So the way the demonic operates, and uh, you might benefit, if you're, in, if you're interested in, in demonology and, and learning about demons and the spirit realm, you'd probably enjoy Dr. Kevin Zadai's teachings on Warrior Notes. He's on YouTube. He also has a school of ministry I'm a student of. Um, demons will give you thoughts, but they can't read them. So here's how this works. Uh, there's the demons are in the spirit realm and they're everywhere. They're disembodied spirits that were destroyed during the flood from the days of Noah. 
what happened was is there was sexual sin and the seed of the serpent got into man and they were creating hybrid creations. Dr. Kevin Zadai. So the seed of the serpent basically created a hybrid race. Now some people will say it was, they were called the Nephilim, the Nephilim. Other people... Listen, it, I, I'm not trying to create a, a doctrinal uh, theological debate about the Nephilim or about the hybrids, but if you study this stuff, it's very like, very interesting, okay, to say the least. God destroyed the world in the flood because there were hybrids on the world in the days of Noah. They tainted their DNA through sexual sin. And when these, these hybrid creations were destroyed, they, they were their fate was determined. They're not going to get into heaven, They're, and they became demonic spirits. That's why there's things called marine kingdom spirits, because demons, these demonic spirits, they are actually territorial. That's why you have ter territorial demonic spirits, and a lot of them are under the ocean. Water doesn't affect demons in the spirit realm. They don't want to be driven out of the area that they're native to. So, if you remember when Jesus cast the demons out of the demoniac, the demoniac man and the, and the, that was living in the tombs, the, de, the demons and the man said, okay, well, if you have to cast us out, if, if it's like that, if it's going to go down like this, please don't cast us out of the area. They, at first, they didn't want to leave the man, but they don't have a choice. So then they're trying to negotiate. Well, we don't want to leave the area. So just cast us into, please cast us into something in, in this area. So... <clears throat> So when it comes to, the, to, to demons like that, that, this is also what happened. If you start to study the Greeks, like the Greek gods and all this stuff, there, a lot of them were hybrids that got destroyed. So some of these like wild-looking creatures were, were very real in, in those days. And then God sent the flood, and now there's water in places now that it was not around back then. So like you've got Atlantis, which is buried under the ocean, and all of these old Greek and, and Roman uh, and, and strange cities that are buried under oceans because the flood covered the territory that these uh, hybrid creations were in. It's, it's really wild. Uh, Kevin Zadai talks about that. He talks about the pyramids. Uh, uh, Gilgamesh and the Freemasons. Why the Freemasons use G as their on their logo? They use the big G. It stands for Gilgamesh, and it comes back to 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 to, to creations that weren't entirely human. And this is like I'm I'm going way out like into stuff that like it's this is stuff you probably like. This is not amp like this isn't uh. This is a deep, like I'm going really deep. I wasn't planning on going this deep. So, but it's really deep. If you study stuff, like if you're curious about like why, why is Freemasonry so prevalent? Well, why were they building the Tower of Babylon? What was the sin in the garden? There's no new sin under the sun. It, it says that in Ecclesiastes. It's in your Bible. So, so Freemasonry at its root is, is not a lot different than humanism and paganism and Satanism it all turns away from God and says you can become like God or that you yourself are God and they deny God. So humanism is when people are um, like the new age, people that are caught up in new age, they'll say, oh, you, you, you're, you're a God. Well, you're created in the image of God, but it's the same lie that the serpent used to deceive Eve in the garden and got her to eat of the fruit that, that she should not have partaken of. And it's so... I don't want to confuse anyone, and I know I'm going way deep here, like super deep. So, but 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 again, um, so so when it comes to demons, someone asked the original question that got me here: the, How did we get here? Okay, like so let's let me back this bus up for a moment. Like, all right, so how we got here is someone asked the question: Can demons read your thoughts? Short answer: No. But the long answer is they will give you a thought and see how do you respond. So if a demon gives you a thought, let's I'll, let's I'll use an example. If a demon makes you think that, like, let's say you're lusting after your neighbor, you're like, why am I feeling this? Like, why am I picturing my neighbor or my neighbor's wife or, or, or husband or whoever it was? The demon now threw a thought at you. Your mind caught it. This is why it says your, your warfare weapons aren't carnal. They're spiritual through the pulling down a stronghold. Strongholds start in your mind. They give you a lie, a thought. Now, if you, if you don't do anything with the thought and you pull it down, 
the demons are going to say, okay, well, that doesn't work. This person's difficult. So if demons see they don't, the way demons operate is on a reward system. They operate on a commission. If every time a demon does a drive-by and gives you a temptation, if you fall for it, you're going to get hit more and more. Then these demons are going to work their way in over time, and they're going to get you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Their, their entire goal is to get you to lose your salvation. They want you to depart from the faith. They want you to uh, be fleshly or carnal. They want you to grieve the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 through 19. Demons want people to not go to heaven. Their whole goal is they're on an assignment from the pit of hell. Sin is what allows demons into our life. So what happens is, is, is here's how a demon operates. A demon initially gets you traumatized. And then, they get, and then the next step for them to go is to get you addicted to medication. They want you to cope with your trauma and cope with your pain. Okay? So, demons want you wounded early in tra childhood trauma. And then, instead of coming to God and going through inner healing and going through deliverance, demons have put pharmacia out there. Sorcery. Medication. And they get everybody to get addicted. And once they can get you addicted on a very strong alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, then you're very easy to manipulate and influence. Demons are disembodied spirits. They want a body. I'll, I'll go deeper. I'm going to teach a little deeper on this today. The reason why demons want to get in your body, Kevin Zadai teaches on this. This is where I learned this stuff under Dr. Kevin Zadai, Warrior Note School of Ministry. The reason why demons want to get in your body is they cannot feel any type of a emotion, they can't feel physical sensation when they're in arid and dry places, which is where they're at, according to Matthew chapter 12. So if a demon can get in your body, that demon that's in your body can feel your sensation. A demon can feel your emotions. A demon can feel an orgasm. It can experience the same sensations that you do in your flesh if the demon is inside your body. <clears throat> so the so a de a demon the demons listen the demons you see the demons manifesting in the chat this this is why. Demons don't like their mode of operation being revealed. That's what that's what's going on. That's why demons are going to they're going to start manifesting. When you start teaching about demons, demons entire goal are to remain unaware. They want you blind. They want you not even knowing that they exist. If a demon can't get you to believe they don't exist, they want you to believe in once saved always saved. So you can just live in sin. So the demons have a body to inhibit. They want you to grieve the Holy Spirit and then they can take you. They want you to be taken. They ultimately want to take you over and drag you off the path. Why? Because the demon can never be. The demon can never be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The demons can never be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Their fate has been sealed. They're stuck for now on earth. They're not stuck in hell. Demons are not. I want to make this very clear. Demons currently are not stuck in hell. They're not trapped. They're on the earth. Now, there will come a day they end up in hell, and they know that. And they know that. But the demons listen to, yes, everything you say. The demons take notes on, on your dad, your mom, your granddad. And they try to work themselves into familiar bloodlines. And they studied your father, your mother, and all those weird habits that are on those relatives you have that some people are like, oh, well, that's just how he is. A lot of people have demons, and then they have weird characteristics. Un well, I shouldn't say weird. That's not the right word. Ungodly behavior, ungodly characteristics. Demons are there to kill, still, and and destroy. Just like John 10.10 10 says, the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy. Demons operate under Satan, and their mode of operation is stealth. I really want to drive this point home. Demons don't want to be revealed. This is why deliverance ministry gets fought harder than anything else. And if, if, if it's not the deliverance ministry that's fought in a lukewarm church, then the next thing they're going to fight is the prophetic. Because when the Spirit of God speaks, when the Holy Spirit speaking through someone, the demons get driven back. The, de the demons get driven back. If you've ever watched Deliverance Ministry, 
were, were like, so for instance, I'll tell you, I've been casting demons out of someone where I've got the strong man bound in the body, and I'm commanding the demon to tell me why he's here, and he can tell me the day he came in, what year it was, and the sin that allows him to be there. They have permission to be there. The demons have permission to be in the people that they're in because the sin gives the demon a legal right to be there. I believe this is going to click. So, demons are in people who give them access by sin. Sin is the door. And when you open up the door to one, they're holding the door open to, to many others. So, like for instance, when people have been into yoga... People have been into witchcraft. People have been into sorcery. People have worshipped the devil. People that have done different types of sin will have different types of demons. And where there's one, there's usually many. There's usually very, very many. Now, now someone asked, uh, do demons have free will? The way that the demons operate is they study you and they see if you're an easy victim. If you're a, does this person have a victim mentality? That's what their first step is. The number one thing a demon's going to do is get you to have a victim mentality. That way you give up. And when something bad happens, you just throw in the towel. And then you give up. You, you don't pray. You don't praise the Lord. You're ungrateful. What happened to the children of Israel when they perished in their desert in rebellion? They were ungrateful. Gratitude is the best attitude. So how you fight demons, how you fight spiritual warfare is with praise. You praise the Lord. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Praise and worship is a great a spiritual warfare weapon. So for anyone struggling with sin currently, praise and worship music, change your friends. Who do you hang out with? You will know them by their fruit. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. So this is something else. And then Hebrews chapter 12 says, Lest a root of bitterness spring from any, any of you, it, it can contain many. If someone is bitter... Because they're wounded and there's there's unforgiveness in their heart, people who are bitter can can contaminate. If someone just wants to fight and argue and rail and rail and rail against you, like don't even have anything to do with those people. Carnal people. This is going to sound like maybe a little bit mean. I'm just being honest. Like um, when people are bitter, they're walking in unforgiveness. They're wounded usually. There's trauma there. Now, trauma will lead to unforgiveness if you're not careful. You've got to be quick to forgive and let go. That's kind of why it's important to not let people that habitually reoffend you, right? So if, if someone in your life is always wounding you over and over, you've got to establish boundaries. F yes, forgive them and love them, but love them from a distance. Especially the devil's a narcissist, okay? So if you've encountered a narcissist before... What, or what the world calls a narcissist, you've encountered someone operating under a demonic spirit. And I mean, like, you know, there's different levels of oppression, but if someone's got, like, spirited Jezebel real bad, they will often do and say things that hurt others, and they don't know. Because that demon is, is trying to make their conscience unaware that they're under the influence of a demon. That's the other thing demons try to do. Again, the demon's mode of operation is stealth. They don't want to be detected. They want you to believe that the person just is a narcissist. Okay, the truth is they probably have the spirit of Jezebel. They probably have the spirit of Jezebel. There's something that they're doing or have done that's allowed these demons to come in. So Satan, the demons that operate under Satan, they give you thoughts and they study you. They, they'll throw a thought. And they'll see, will you, if we make you think about sex, will you go look at porn, for instance? And if you won't, and you never succumb to what they're trying to get you to do, they're going to move on. Demons operate on, on, on a, uh, they operate on a commission type basis. So if you're struggling with sin really bad, the demons are just having a free day usually. They're just having a free for all. They want you to stay a slave to sin. They want you on the broad path. They want, demons want you on the broad path through addiction through, um, you know, Jezebel's spirit comes in through um, sexual sin, typically, and people that have pornography, immoral sexual relations. It says this in Revelation chapter 2, verses 20 and 23. And then what happens is if people don't get delivered from Jezebel, they usually end up in a sickbed. Their health is affected. 
I was bedridden for a couple of years, off and on, I, from all the demons, and, and I had to go through deliverance, which is repentance. When you when you when you put down the sin habit and you start to crucify the uh, the the uh, the flesh, you you won't have the demon problems because in Luke ten nineteen Jesus gave you the authority, and also it's again in Mark sixteen seventeen those who believe signs and wonders will follow. They're going to cast out demons in the power of Jesus' name. They're going to speak in new tongues. And again, it's all reiterated as well in the book of Acts. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people need a spiritual cleanse. They need to uh, uh, cleanse their home of pornography. You can get, listen, you can have, uh, like, I'll, I'll tell you personally, I don't watch secular TV shows. I don't go to the movies anymore. There's so much programming and movies, and, and they're demonic. Your eye is the gate to your soul, to your body. It's the window to your to your soul. So if you watch demonic videos, video games, you're playing all types of, uh, if you're playing, like, in video games and wicked movies and stuff and watching these, like, Marvel movies where these characters are 100% demonic, I'm even talking, like, Spider-Man is demonic. These characters are territorial spirits, and they put them on children's TV shows and they idolize them. Why? Because the Satan, the devil, who is the lowercase g god of this world, his power is the principality of the air. He works through distractions. He works through, um, he works through s- different things. You know, this app, for instance. There's all types of people that dance on here, and they get on this app, and those are distractions. The enemy works through the flesh. He gets people to give in to lust. If the devil can get you to give in to lust and and, and watch people and start lusting after people or watch pornography, that door is opened. It's the door is open to sin, and that sin door opens up. Here come the demons, and then and then how? So a lot of people will say, "Well, how do I know if I have demons? Do you struggle with lust? Do you struggle with pornography, masturbation, uh, sexual purity? Do you think about sex all the time? Do you crave sex? Do you crave lust? Do you crave violence? Do you crave ungodly things? Do you crave going out to bars and cigarettes and marijuana? Are you turning to people, money, and drugs?" for your validation and and love, which should come from Jesus. See, anything that we turn to that's not Jesus is idolatry. Now, I'm not saying that uh, marriage is a bad thing or that having friendships is bad. Not at all. But honor God in all that you do. It is by his grace that we're here. Fear is a demonic spirit that comes in when, when a lot of times, so it says in the word of God that perfect love casts out all fear. So if you get into God's presence and you can and you can understand who you are by getting into the word of God and get the word of God in you so much that you're transformed by the word because the word is made it's made new in you your mind is made new you will then live according to the word I'm just prophesying to you by the spirit right now when you get into the word the word gets into you when you read the bible the bible reads you so what you if you're struggling with fear God is love Perfect love casts out fear. So if you get God and God's word inside of you enough, your mind will become transformed and you'll no longer have a victim mentality. Seeing yourself as a victim is what allows fear to reign in your life. If you see yourself as defeated, then you're going to allow a spirit of fear to come in because you don't have a proper identity. You have This is why the devil... Okay, this is a great point to make. The devil attacks people's identity because your identity is in Jesus Christ. So if he can get you to watch... Uh, pornography that confuses your identity, your gender identity, or any identity, especially gender identity, what does Satan want? He wants to change your identity and take you out of the identity that Jesus Christ created you in. You, yeah, oh yeah, hate what God hates. It's good to hate the devil and hate sin, not the person, not the sinner. If someone's a sinner and they're living in sin, hate the sin by telling them the truth. When you, true love, you want to know what true love is? True love is to worship God in spirit and in truth. What does God say? In Proverbs 6.16, 6, he gives a list of things he hates. If you can learn to hate what God hates, then you can learn to love what God loves. Amen? So, and, and when it comes to demons, you've got to be very rough. You've got to be, the demons respond to authority. So when I do deliverance, if I'm casting out demons out of someone, I think of myself as like a drill instructor. I don't take lip. If I'm doing deliverance and a demon tries to tell me something, 
I hear I you know I have the discernment from the Holy Spirit and if 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 this demon manifests in someone and it says it's it's you know it'll tell me why it's there and here's what they see the demons see the light of Jesus Christ shining through you when you do deliverance on someone as as a as a minister of deliverance the demons see themselves being pulled before the throne of God and they and they know they're coming their judgments come so they have to for the demons do have to tell the truth when you're doing deliverance when they're bound and found out they they'll tell you but what will happen is if someone has the spirit of Jezebel in them and they've been in sin for a long time and, and all types of stuff sometimes the spirit of Jezebel will throw lower level demons to come up at first and you'll just be starting to encounter like these demons that have weird names and stuff and then you'll ask the demon are you the strong man and then it'll tell you no I'm not so you you say okay I cast you out once you've broken their legal right to be there, have the person repent and renounce the sin, that demon gets cast out, but then you have to go call out the strong man demon, and it'll be Jezebel, or it'll be Satan, or there's usually a, there's a strong man. So, but again, you know, here's the, here's the thing where deliverance, and not everybody is going gonna, is gonna to agree with me on deliverance, but, you know, if, you, if, you're, if I just cast demons out of people all day, but don't teach them how to stay delivered, I'm doing them a disservice. I have to be honest and tell people, to repent, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. If today was your last day, are you right with God? So what I'm saying is, is I want to pour myself out all the way every time I talk to you, like this could be the last message you ever hear. And, I, and, I, and if it was, I would want you to know, repent. Like, after this live stream, get on your knees and ask Jesus to forgive you. If there's sin in your heart, ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit once you've been forgiven and give you the gift of tongues so you can pray in the Spirit and build up. When you pray in tongues, the Spirit of God is inside of you and and, and His Spirit gets stirred up and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will start working in you when you pray in tongues and read the Word of God. And, and 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 here's what happens. Here's where people get off track in regards to trauma and stuff like that. If someone's wounded and from trauma and they've been living and struggling in sin, right? A lot of times what happens is they allow their emotions to rule them. And they become led by the flesh, led by the lust of the flesh. And they turn to everything that makes, now catch this, they turn to whatever makes them feel good as a temporary means of support. That's why that relationship didn't make you happy. That's why the drugs didn't fix you. That's why the pills wore off and the high came off and then they weren't, you felt worse than before. That's why the marijuana made you feel good for half an hour but not forever. It's because it's a band-aid. It's a band-aid. The drugs are a band-aid. The pills are a band-aid. The sex is a band-aid. No matter how beautiful a man or a woman is, that is lust. And anything you're turning to other than Jesus Christ to be healed it's not going to heal you. It's going to bring, yes, dissatisfaction. It's going to bring you any type of thing. It, it, the, the, okay, so this comes back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow is what you will reap. So if you're witnessing to people and you're praying for people and you're sharing the truth, the full gospel, the word of God with people, you're sowing into the spirit, and you're going to reap a harvest in the spirit. God will bless that. God will pour out the water of heaven and put an increase on that work. But if you're in the flesh, and all you do is sow into the flesh, I'm talking about argue, gossip, have sexual morality. If you're just sowing into the flesh you will reap corruption what does romans say in, in three chapter 3 verse 23 the wages of sin is death you're sowing into the wages of death if you're living in sin so sin is like a downhill staircase dune 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 you're just walking down into the into the death now here's what here, this is this is sanctification so you get to the point where you're sick of sin and you're like all right lord i'm going to get set free today and you start prophesying over yourself you start laying hands on yourself you're anointed your home you're anointing your forehead you're sick of sin. You're, you've walked so far down on that ladder. You're like, okay, I'm going to turn around today. And you start walking back into eternal life. You get back on that narrow path. And I just want to prophesy right now in the name of Jesus. That is exactly what's happening to everybody here. That you shall be kept on the narrow path in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus washes over everybody here. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, I decree and declare that no cur- no curse, no witchcraft, no pills will have a hold on them anymore. I prophesy in the name of Jesus. They're going to get dreams at night. They're going to hear the voice of the Lord speaking to them when they wake up. They're going to get on their knees and pray and repent. And they're going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.
So another good thing, uh, another good piece of scripture I really, really like is uh, James chapter 5. So if, if, you're, if you're a newer Christian or you're newer in the faith and you're like, where do I start, brother? Where do I start? Go to James chapter 5. James 5.19, this is what we're supposed to do. Here, this is, if you, if you can feed on one scripture today, here's a good one. James 5.19, finally, as members of God's beloved family, we must go after the one who wanders from the truth and bring him back. For the one who restores the, catch this part, sinning believer. For the one who restores the sinning believer back to God from the error of his way, gives back to his soul life from the dead, and covers over countless sins by their demonstration of love. Amen, James 5.19. Think about that. What, is it, what else does it say in the word? God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you share the love and the light of Jesus Christ with people, God is going to pour his spirit out on you, and you're going to see a blessing and a reward so big that you've never even been able to dream of such things. It says that he will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so big it's going to be running down, shaking over, poured down. It's going to be pressed out, shaking, running over. Your cup's going to be rubbing, running over full. Why? Because ministry is an outflow. It's an overflow. It's when, you're, when, when God's spirit is inside of you and the word is in you, the word and the spirit of God agree on who he is and then you get set free and then your life becomes transformed and made in the image of Christ and then it is greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world that means Jesus's earthly ministry is now done through you and and who is in the world it's the spirit of uh, it's the spirit of antichrist the spirit of antichrist is the spirit that's in this world and that's the spirit you know that's the spirit of the devil he's what what the devil's trying to do is he like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch back I'm gonna circle back and touch on this point again because I know someone needs to hear this Demons are studying your behavior. They know your weakness. They know you like uh, fast cars or pretty women, for example. And if they can appeal to you and put that beautiful woman, beautiful man, or, or see, will you compromise if we, if we give you a job? I'm just making up examples here. So let's say if a demon can get you to take a job that is going to make you compromise on your values for God, if they can get you to do that, then they're going to try to get you to do something else. And they're going to one bite by a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Just one bite at a time. That's how demons work. They're studying you. Demons are watching you when you're alone in your bedroom and there's no one home. They're waiting for you to hit, uh, get on your phone and look at that adult website. They're waiting for you to cuss, get into sin. Now, if you start to get into sin, here's my advice immediately repent turn yourself in to the lord in prayer and it says in the word you know did you did did you know you can avoid temptation through prayer like lights i i I pray in jesus name lights are going off right now did you know that you can avoid certain temptations through prayer i'm serious i mean this from the heart you can if you struggle with something here's my question do you have not because you ask not so again i will say if you're struggling with a specific sin have you been asking god to take it away and and sometimes you got to keep standing on that promise keep standing on that promise keep standing on that promise and if someone's like well i prayed i prayed but then i didn't really like stick around what does it say in james chapter 1 verse 6 the ambivalent man how can someone expect to receive from the Lord when they're in the condition of being ambivalent, double-minded? If someone's double-minded, if you're to and you're fro, you're going to be tossed back and forth. You're unstable in all your ways, according to God's word. Word. <clears throat> Standing on what promise? The word of God. So, you, so this is where it comes in handy to be in a Bible study or to become a student of like a uh, evangelistic outreach. Like for me, I'm a student of warrior notes. I stand on the word of God. And when you know the word of God well enough to know what a lie looks like, to know what's of God. See, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between joint, marrow, spirit, bone, soul, and body. The sword of God cuts me and you. When I preach, it's cutting me too. So if there was something not right in me, it's, it's cutting me. I, I'll get convicted if I'm, if I'm in sin. If I've done something wrong, I have to repent. So I'm preaching to myself and I'm preaching to you. Well, what do you mean by that? All right, so 
you've got to know the word of God and it has to get inside of you and it takes hold. It takes root in your heart and you will change and become more like Jesus Christ every single day. That's why it says in 1 John chapter 3, it goes on to say that um, you will go on to sin no more because you've been fathered by God himself and his seed remains in you. His seed is the wa- is the uh, the word. Is the word. Is the word. <sighs> Yeah, so, so, and again, um, what you, what word is used to fight temptation? Um, yeah, well, I would say if you're, if you're struggling with temptation, go read Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 23, and just start to understand, uh, so, so here's how, here's where your discernment comes in. Once you've accepted Jesus, and you've received the Holy Spirit, you're a born-again Christian, if you're still struggling with sin, you, you got to ask Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit to take that away from you. And, and you have to then you have to learn how to know what is good and what is evil. And the way you know good from evil is through the Word, because God is the Word. And when the Word of God is in you, you, you're, you filter your life through the Word of God. Now I'm not saying let you just memorize a couple scriptures, but it's a daily walk where you're gonna le- you're gonna memorize more and more scripture, but also you're gonna act, you're gonna you're gonna operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You may not realize that I'm prophesying over you right now in Jesus' name. So you're gonna operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and then your testimony will set other people free in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus washes over you and sets you free. The blood of Jesus commands the demons to leave, and the blood of Jesus destroys the the lies of the enemy. The blood of Jesus washes over every curse. The blood of Jesus washes over every high tower and stronghold the enemy has tried to put in your mind. The way the enemy operates, another mode, an operation, this is how demons work. They get you to believe one lie, and then they try to build up a wall. They keep putting blocks up. And if you can believe one lie, then two, then three, then four, then five. Before you know it, you got a stronghold. The Lord is a strong tower. and He's a mighty refuge to all to run to him. But the enemy tries to copy God. The demons will try to build a stronghold, a tower in your mind. For some of you, you've been dreaming about towers, perhaps. Here is my question. If you're dreaming about towers, what tower have you ran into? Amen? What tower have you ran into? You can ask the Lord to give you the ability to interpret your own dreams as well. So, but some people dream about towers. The Lord is a mighty tower. He is a refuge of strength and mighty to save. He is a mighty warrior and he is victorious. The victory is in his hands. But you have to come to Jesus Christ. You have to come to Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times, here's what happens. A lot, like when you're, a, when you're a babe, when you're a babe in Christ, when you're a baby Christian at first, like we have a tendency to come to church and leave, come to church and leave, but you can't remain unchanged. That's why it says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, that you must prove your repentance by a changed life. This is where discipleship comes in handy. Like if you're feeling led to go into ministry and you know you have a calling on your life, but you don't know where to go first, Further, then, then what I would recommend is like uh, possibly like so warriornotesschool.com has a free class if you if you're just curious like why is earth the way it is why do I think the way that I think okay so there's another good course that I would recommend called Lord help me to understand myself it teaches you about trauma trauma resolve and another thing that is, is, is very necessary to understand is, is that uh, is Paul, and, and when he wrote Second Timothy chapter 2, when you come into 24, he says there's people that um, oppose themselves within themselves. Well, what is he talking about? There's a war. Ephesians chapter 6 describes putting on the armor of God. The armor is necessary because when you become a Christian, you're, you're put into a spiritual war. That spiritual war is going on around you whether you like it or not. And, and, and to put on the full armor of God means you need to know who you are in Christ. You need to know and understand your authority. And then you, you have to learn how to put to death the flesh. You have to learn how... You, uh, we should all be equipped to do deliverance. And it's not real complicated. Deliverance is just a matter of knowing what not to ask but command. Someone's going to get set free. So a lot of times when people are like, will you pray for me? I'm going to command life into your body right now in Jesus' name. And if someone needs deliverance, command the demons right now. Every demon, I bind every stronghold in Jesus' name, and I command it to be crushed by the blood of Jesus Christ right now in Jesus' name. 
But but I want to tell you this. Deliverance isn't just getting set free and then going back to sin. To stay free, you have to repent from sin. I mean, for I literally mean grab the wheel, take control of your life in Jesus' name, and you turn away from sin. If you have to cut the cigarettes in half and smoke a half of one and then wean off on a, a patch... Or if it's for pornography, I was addicted to pornography since I was eight years old, and I gave it up two years ago. Or maybe it was two two or two and a half years ago, something like that. So, again, the Lord will take away these addictions, and then once you're free, you become the light of Jesus Christ, glory to God. He'll, it'll shine through you, and your, your uh, yes, all Christians should, should see, uh, pray in tongues. Paul said, I, I, I speak in tongues more than all of you. And in Mark sixteen seventeen, those that, that those who believe these signs and wonders shall follow. They're going to cast out demons in the power of Jesus' name, and they're going to speak in new tongues. And uh, you'll start seeing that resurrection power of the Spirit of God when uh, when when you're walking in alignment and authority and obedience to the Word of God. Then you're walking in authority. You know, when Jesus told the centurion soldier he would come and heal him, and the centurion soldier said, "No, that's okay. Just send your word, and it will be done." It was because the the, the centurion soldier he understood authority. Faith is authority. Jesus equated his authority understanding of faith. Think about that. The army of heaven, it's an army. Jesus is the commander of the angel armies. So if Jesus is the hey Steffi, if Jesus is the high commander of armies of angels, then that tells you you're a soldier in God's army. What do soldiers do? We're under authority. What is faith? Faith is authority. Wait a minute, I never heard that. Yeah, what does a soldier do? A soldier is under authority. So let me just, I'll paint the picture. I'm gonna bre- I'll break it down for a moment. I don't know how much longer I have to be on here, but I'll break this down. So authority is like this. When a soldier goes to war, and we're in one, by the way. We're in a war. When a soldier goes to war, you're, you're not going to have to worry about paying your own way. God will provide. But the, the, the artillery, the weaponry, the armor, it's already been provided. It's already in your word. It's just you've got to pick up your sword and fight back now. So you now know what you have to do, but it's up to you to, to decide to make the necessary steps to actually embrace what you've learned and then go after it. Go after the word. What do you say to get demons to manifest? So um, if you're trying to deliver someone in your family, they have to A, be willing to go through it, and if you're if 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 you are if you're a if you're feeling led to do deliverance, if you're one on one with a person, you can look into their eyes, you can actually tell their human spirit to step aside, and then you can you can bind the strong man. You can you say, I bind the strong man with a three strand cord and the blood of Jesus Christ, and I command the strong man demon to manifest. Usually about that time. Usually about that time, they're going to show their teeth. The person may start growling. I would not recommend doing this alone on a one-on-one setting because sometimes the person can become physically violent. You want to make sure you have help. If you're going to do that, make sure that you know from the Lord it's okay. Like, Don't do this where you're in an environment where someone may try to physically assault you. I've been in a situation where this man had so many demons, it took two men to hold a guy down one time while we were casting demon, while I was casting his demons out, and this man had thousands of demons, and once you get to the strong man, the strong man will pull out the, the other demons with him. They get cast out. And, and the demons get angry, they'll show their teeth, they may threaten you, they'll say all sorts of things. And also, what demons will try to do is, is they will try to hold back. So if you start telling someone, to, uh, tell, their, tell their demons to manifest, you tell the strong man, I command you to come up in the name of Jesus and state your name. And, 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 and usually their eyes will get real big. Or, or they might sit there and just be silent and stare at you like this with real big eyes. Just keep on commanding that you start smiting that demon with the blood of Jesus. I command the blood of Jesus to torment you with fire in Jesus' name. And those demons start begging you to stop. Stop, stop, you know. We'll leave or, or whatever. That's that's how it is. But again, you have to know how to do this because these demons are there because they have a legal right. You can't do deliverance on someone that doesn't want to repent from sin. If someone's not going to leave sinning, they're going to have they're, they're going to keep their demons. 
They're going to keep the demons. Listen, what good is it to cast demons out of you if you're going to go sin five minutes later and, and light up or whatever it is? Those demons are there because they haven't repented from something. Now, the situation's different. If someone's repented and confessed their sin and they're no longer living in it and there's just something sticking around, those demons will leave very easily usually. They, they, they go right away. The only reason those demons might even be there is they don't have a legal right. They could just be squatting at that point. But if that person's walking in the presence of God and they're, they're praying in tongues, those demons will leave anyways. They don't want to be there. If someone's praying in tongues and reading the word of God and they're in a praise and worship setting on a regular basis in, in their home and they've made the home atmosphere conducive to praise and worship, they're, you're not going to see a lot of that. So typically when people have um, need repeat deliverance or there's demons that are there, there's typically they're not ready. They aren't ready for deliverance. If they were ready, they would have repented and the demons would go because according to Luke 10, 19, you've got the authority to command them to go. That person could command their own demons to go, but if they're staying in the sin, the demons don't really leave. It's a, it becomes a cycle of repeat deliverance and they're going to bring the demons back worse. So that's why I say like, that's why I touch back on this because yes, like you will see people. Now this is where it gets interesting. You're, you will find people that are more than willing to cast demons out. But again, you know, it's really about you knowing that you can cast the demons out of yourself. He, he's got to know to cast the demons out of himself. But at the same time, the, the real problem is you don't want to treat the fruit. You got to treat the root, the root. So to treat the root, you need to go to the root of the problem. Like, is it unforgiveness? Is he bitter? Is there hardening of his heart? And then there's the next question. <coughs> Excuse me. There's the next question. Does he want deliverance? Some people don't want to. Some people want to keep their demons. They're, they are stuck in sin. They can't see it. So in that case, if that's the situation, if they're walking in pride and they're wounded, what does pride do? Pride is a spirit, and it tells you that you know better than God. It tells you that you don't need God. That's what pride does. That's why it says in James chapter 4 that if you are walking in pride, God opposes you. So the step to getting delivered, if he really wants deliverance, is to get humble get on his face, ask Jesus Christ to forgive him for all of his sins, take every addiction away. You got remember, you got to be humble. If someone, I'll give you an example, if someone's if someone's proud, the word says God opposes the proud, so they can't they're not prepared to receive deliverance. You have to be humble. You got to be humble to prepare yourself. You have to your heart has to be postured to God. Now, if someone's hearing this message and they're starting to realize well, maybe I need some deliverance. You may you may want to fast, try a water fast for a couple days, or you could do a Daniel fast, um, give up meat, sugar, stuff like that. And what that will do is, if you fast, fasting isn't how you. Get, now, this is this is the interesting part too. Fasting is not how you get rid of demons. Fasting will help you build faith to get in God's presence, to read the word and have understanding. If you starve your flesh of what it wants, which is attention and, and it wants uh, to argue, it wants to watch uh, violent video games or pornography or smoke cigarettes, whatever it is. If you starve your flesh and feed it the word, then what will happen is, is your heart's going to start to reposture and turn back to the Lord. That, a first step of repentance well, resentment, yeah, resentment kind of comes with unforgiveness, bitterness. Uh, I, ca I just kind of call it bitterness, but for sure, resentment. Um, and, and, and what will happen, too, is, is if you've forgiven everybody in your life that hurt you, you'll be able to pray for that person and have no more negative emotions about them. So, for instance, I was a man who lived lukewarm and I had many demons, but I wasn't delivered by like a deliverance minister or a pastor. I was delivered by Jesus. I had to get on my face in my home privately. I, I went through deliverance. Now, I did go to an outdoor praise and worship setting where I prayed and I was like, hey, I want deliverance, but no one like laid hands on me and I fell to the ground and coughed up blood for half an hour while demons came out. And a lot of other people got set free that night too, but I needed repeat deliverance. I kept falling back into hanging out with the wrong people. I would fall back into gossip. I would fall back into, into little types of sins and stuff like that. And I would have like little struggles and what I really needed was to hear God's voice because, you know, I operate in, a, in, in, the, in the prophetic. So 
what happens too is uh, all right. So sorry, I had a phone call. Kind of lost lost where I was at. But so, so for sure, when it comes to deliverance, like I have people that will ask um, that will ask for deliverance. But then if you start talking about repentance, you know, if someone's not ready to repent or if they're proud and they think they know better, then you can't deliver them from pride. They have to willfully uh, submit to Jesus Christ. So, so again, like this is a uh, Isaiah Saldivar talked on this. He touched on this subject uh, in the park he preached at two weeks ago. I saw him in Orlando. He's like, I don't want to become an idol where people only want me to pray for them. But we have to teach people to pray for themselves and cast demons out of their their relatives and their loved ones. So, so a lot of times, like I'm always putting it back. I'm always shifting the focus off of me. I don't know if uh, this is my goal, anyways. I, I hope people see this. That I always want to teach you to do what I know how to do because my I'm I'm called to teach and equip you. Like uh, as someone in God's army, you know, you got to equip. I got to equip you and teach you what I know. So, cause I don't want power. I don't want control. I don't want to manipulate anybody. I'm not, I'm, I don't care about, I never want, I'm going to tell you the truth. I had no intentions of being a, becoming a pastor, going into ministry. I wanted to be like a car dealership guy. I wanted to have a business. I just wanted to be a businessman. So sometimes people get into ministry. Again, this comes down to intentions of the heart. I'm doing this because I love God and I fear God. So I love God's people. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm called to do this. It's different than wanting to do it. Like I didn't send myself into evangelism school. Like I actually had to go through deliverance. What first started? So what started me onto the path I'm on now was I was bedridden sick for years because I had looked at pornography, gone to strip clubs, done drugs. God had thrown me in a sick bed. It says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, if you play with Jezebel, if you fornicate with Jezebel, if you tolerate Jezebel, if you're dating dancers, if you're dating people that, uh, if you're having relationships that you're not married to, if you're doing partying and drugs and drunkenness and you're having premarital sex, you're, you're doing wild lifestyles like that, you're going to have spirit of Jezebel come in, you end up with a chronic illness that nobody can explain. Doctors will say it's Lyme disease, it's this, it's that. But you're sick, and you're on a sick bed. And it, you, I didn't get free until I repented. And that's correct. Leviathan and Jezebel, they're like this, hand in hand. Job chapter 41 says, The spirit of Leviathan is over all the children of pride. People who have the spirit of Leviathan in them, they got, they got headaches, neck aches, back pain, back aches. If you're, I'm saying if you're in pride, you know, that's a common one anyways. But Jezebel and, 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 and that go together. They go together a lot. The sick bed. What is this? Okay, so a lot of people that you see people in their 20s and their 30s, and they're going to, to 14 different doctors, and no one can explain what's wrong with them. You have no energy. You're sick all the time. I'm talking, a, I'm calling a sick bed unexplainable illnesses. That don't make sense. Your blood pressure's up, it's down. Your heart rate's up, it's down. You're sweating, you've got hot sweats, cold sweats, chills. Weird things are happening in your body. It's from demons. It's demons. It's demons. You start sweating and you don't understand. You're breaking out in sweats. It's demons. You're waking up in the middle of the night sweating like crazy. It's demons. It's demons. Once you get deliverance from all that, it goes away. God heals you. Also, something I noticed when I needed deliverance real bad and I had lots of demons, if I look at pictures of me from two years ago, you would see like, so right now, I know there's a little bit of a shadow right here. I used to have black bags around my eyes and you would see black like all around my eyes. And it says in the Bible, if the eye gate be darkened, then the whole light must be full of that darkness. How dark must that darkness truly be? So if you're looking at pornography, this is like really a deep teaching. And I can't prove, I can tell you that's in the word. It says your eye is the lamp. It's the, it's the light into your body. What you look at and put in your eye and your ear it comes into your body. So if you're if you're consuming pornography and violence and cuss words and, and, and adult night lifestyles of lo- of living, darkness comes into your body and your whole body is full of darkness. So you know, I kn- and that might be a stretch for some. That when I tell you my physical body was changed when I had demons, I was overweight. I had a lot of health problems. I was stuck in a sick bed. I couldn't even get out of bed. I couldn't walk ten feet. I, I had to. I needed people to help me walk. 
Let me look it up. It's on if the eye be dark, the eye is the lamp. It's in Matthew, and I think it's in Mark too. Hold on, let me look that up. Uh, I don't have it memorized. If the eye be dark, I be single. I want to make sure before I just start guessing. Matthew six twenty two. If the uh, the eye is the lamp of the body, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Um, that's Matthew six twenty two. So. Yep, Matthew six twenty two. So it's it, the eye is the lamp to the body. So if if, if you'll see a direct correlation between um, what you're looking at on the internet and living. So this is another. This might be another eye opener. I used to I used to research the occult. I used to research aliens. I used to research UFOs and and, and Freemasonry. And but I ha- I needed deliverance, and I was looking into all this darkness, and I was putting more and more darkness into my mind. But I was starving my life of the Word of God. Listen, people are like, man, you know a lot. I know a lot about that stuff because I studied the darkness, but now I study the light. And I'm telling you, you don't need to, you don't have to study the wrong answers to know the right ones. Okay, so whoever this is for, like, just be set free. You don't have to find out the hard way. Is what I'm saying. Like you can learn from the Bible what not to do, and you don't have to find out firsthand that you end up in a sick bed for having premarital sex. I, I I pray in Jesus' name to set some young person free or whoever is listening. You don't have to succumb to premarital sex and allow that demon into your body, that that curse to come upon you. Wait until you're married and enjoy sex. Enjoy that because it's, marital sex is holy. God created it to be holy. You're supposed to be able to rejoice in your in your, in your marriage and your in your sex life with your marriage. You should have good sex. That's a good thing. God created it, but if it's done in the wrong way, it can bring many many bad curses into your life. And this type of teaching, like man, like I'm telling you, this is. But but I mean, hey, listen. Church is wherever uh, the spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty. Where two or three are gathered in His name, Jesus is in the midst of us. The power is here. So I used to have the darkness around my eyes. Oh, that's another good one, Janice. Amen. Soul ties. People who um, see yourself having sex in dreams with people. You got a soul tie with someone. Someone you 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 uh, had sex with many years ago maybe, outside of marriage, and now they're in your dreams all the time. What is that? Why do I keep seeing this person? You've got to repent. Confess to Jesus Christ in prayer. Say, Jesus Christ, I wash with the blood of Jesus myself, the person that I see, and I ask that you would forgive me and them for the sexual sin we committed in Jesus' name. And I pray that they would they would be set free from seeing me in dreams, and I would be set free from seeing them in dreams. I confess the sin, Lord, and I thank you for being faithful and just for forgiving me for that sin. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Your, <clears throat> you said um, your husband dreams about you with people. So that's a uh, okay. So that's a little bit. Are you are you referring I don't want to be too personal. But like fantasizing and stuff is something that um that's that is demonic. When and I've 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 experienced what you're saying, Amy, from your past, right? Like visualizing that or I've experienced where you visualize or you fantasize about like that or seeing that there but again so if i don't know if it's a fantasy or if it's unwanted but i guess it it doesn't so much matter really why but it okay so like if someone is i understand like i understand the perspective of that and, and, and the thought of that and all that stuff um typically when someone experiences that they've been conditioned by watching that type of pornography or they've experienced trauma where they were wounded from from a from a woman or a man in your case he let's say he was wounded by a woman he was cheated on people who fantasize about being cheated on or seeing their significant other with another person if that's what this is that's usually a trauma where they've tried to patch the pain with the pornography that makes them think it's okay. 
for that to happen. And then they fantasize about a toxic behavior. This, this is probably going to sound very deep, but it appeals to their insecurities. Amen. So if, if, if it's a fantasy, that's what you would call a destructive habit. It's a stronghold. It's in the mind. That's a stronghold. He's, he has to captivate that thought, that fantasy, or that fear. It's an insecurity. It's either an insecurity or a fantasy, and they're both rooted, rooted in a stronghold. Either way, there's a lie there. Right. Bringing up the past, that's an insecurity all, all day. That's insecurity. So, if someone's insecure, they, they're likely there's an identity crisis there. There's someone feeling insecure in who they are. Hmm. So, he's having dreams about that, okay? Has he gone... My very first question would be this. This is probably where I need to go with this. Has he gone to the Lord? Does he hear from the Lord? Does he pray? I, I would just say it starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything is revolves around our relationship with Jesus. But he brings up your wild past all the time. So that... Okay, so... Uh, that's definitely something I would I would would encourage. Here's what you need to do. Will will he pray with you? Will he pray with you? If you guys come together, you guys are married, right? If y'all can both get on your knees and pray together to be healed of that, Jesus is going to heal you. Y'all have to pray together and bring that to the to the cross. Crucify that. Crucify that stronghold and ask him Ask, I mean him, I mean ask Jesus to take that away while you're both together in prayer. That's a, that's a marital issue. You're joined in union as one. You guys are one flesh. So you need to take that together in Jesus and ask him to break that curse, that stronghold. And there may be trauma there he needs healing from. So... You need to take that to the Lord in prayer, and He'll He'll set you free from that. That's that's just a matter of. Um, but again, if He's struggling with that, you know that's how you handle it. Handle it together in prayer. All right, guys. So I have to run. I do actually have to go. It's five twenty-four. All right. So I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus for everybody here that the blood of Jesus seals this message. Holy Spirit, I thank you for touching them, for moving upon them, Lord. I thank you for the deliverance by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, washing them over right now from the head of their, their crown of their head to the, their toes on their feet, Lord. I plead the blood of Jesus over their marriages, their children, their finances, their bank accounts, jobs, vehicles. I break the power of evil off their lives by the power of the blood of Jesus. And we seal up this message with the blood of Jesus, Lord. All glory belongs to you, Lord God. You are a good God. We thank you for forgiving us for all of our sins and for giving them an, an amazing testimony of healing in their marriages and their personal lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless everybody here. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen.